is Smoke Radio for the Masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. All right, Fade to Black. Bespoke radio for the masses. That's right. Today is Tuesday, March 14th. 73 days into the new year, just 292 days left. We are live from a bunker somewhere in downtown Burbank, California. And I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States. Hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR. The Game Changer Network and KGRA The Planet. I'm your host, Jimmy Church, and I'm going to say it loud and clear. What is cracking, everybody? Man, oh, man. Love it. Love the dancers. Love Twitter. Bunker Cam is in my face. One of these days, I just tweeted out right before the show. So one of these days, man, one of these days, I'm going to tape this sucker up. I'm going to tape it. All right. Let's go tonight. Tonight we have a very special guest. John D'Souza is with us. The X-Man. He is a 20-year FBI agent veteran who is now an ET investigator and author. That's right. So tonight it's The Real X-Files. Tomorrow night, Linda Moulton Howe is going to be here. We're going to talk about the pyramids in Alaska and Antarctica. Thursday night is another Fader Night with John Rappaport and his No More Fake Newsroom Live. And, of course, the call in number is 323-825-5045. I was talking to John before the show tonight. And uh, not Rappaport, D'Souza. And he's like, man, I want to take calls. Okay, man. You want to take calls? We'll take calls. So we'll open up the phone lines a little bit later. All right. Follow us on Twitter at J Church Radio, Facebook, YouTube. Just go over to our our, our website. Click on uh, those little buttons. Follow, like, and subscribe. It's all very simple uh, here with this show. Twitter is everything. Our Twitter verse, the sandbox, the fader knots, the family. This show. That's how we do it. We have the chat rooms. Uh, over at KGRA, the planet, we have the uh, chat rooms in Spreaker, and we have the sandbox in Twitter. So whatever your devil of choice is, wherever you want to go and hang out, you can do it. All right. Sandbox is live uh, in real time. The chat rooms are live in real time. Okay. So just come and hang out. Any questions or comments, you can post them in Twitter, hashtag F2BQ. Uh, You can get it up in uh, the uh, chat rooms. And if you're lucky, I'll catch it. Okay. They're all in front of me. I I can see them all. I can't see them all at the same time. And then if I don't catch it there, you can email Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Great show lined up tonight. I'm very excited. First time guest, John D'Souza is going to be here. And uh, the, uh, you know, I'm going to reserve my, my comments and personal experiences with the FBI for John, <laughs> I was going to say something right now. We'll save that. Personal experiences. What are you talking about, church? Well, you know, you have to wait. John will be here in a few short minutes. And uh, don't forget, you can. I, I have been talking about this lately. And I just want to drive this home. We have our new membership area. Don't confuse that with the podcast. 
two different things, all right? The podcast is $2 a month, has apps, everything is there. You can go click, go to iTunes, uh, go to the Google Store, download our apps, $2 a month, boom, you get the show, right? That includes commercials, all right? It's just this show tonight live that is broadcast out, and then we take that and we upload it to our podcast, and it is there so everybody can hear the show in its entirety, all right, and the, the the reason why the commercials are there, um, it's it's editing. I don't want anything edited. I want it preserved as the show went down. So in the future, those archives, ten years from now, twenty years from now, that's the way the show went down. It's archived. All right, so that's what goes on with the podcast. That's two dollars a month. You need it. You need to uh, uh, listen to the show going to work the next day. You can't catch it live. There you go, $2 a month. You know, we would do it for free if we could. We can't, but there you go, all right? But the membership area is different. The membership area is there for the fader knots, and it is in addition to everything else that we do. The membership area will give you archives that are commercial-free, all right? And, and then there's other benefits. If you subscribe for the year, uh, you get the uh, bunker cam. I think that's how it's set up. You get the bunker cam. You can become a fader not for free in the membership area. Again, don't confuse that with the podcast. Separate d- entities altogether. So you can become a fader not. Go to the membership area. Just become a fader not. It's free. How cool is that? And you get the b- bunker cam on Thursday nights for fader night. All right. And the rest of it is there. So you have show archives. Uh, we've got uh, 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 special hats that, that I sign. You know, those are autographed. You get those with the yearly subscription. And that is all separate, too, from the podcast. I just want to be clear. And the reason why, uh, and, and thank you to everybody that has become a member. The numbers are tremendous. I mean, I'm just blown away by that. Thank you for that. But um, the podcast numbers is uh, have gone through the roof. I mean, they've gone through the roof. I, I, I just can't figure it out. So I don't know if it's because people think that the membership area is the podcast or the podcast or the membership. I haven't got an email on that yet. But I just, you know, thank you. That's all I can say. But that's what's going on. So we had two separate things. Podcast is a podcast. Membership area is a membership area. Okay. All right. Are we clear? Are we done? Happy Pi Day, everybody. Um, there's going to be more on this Pi Day tomorrow. Today is Happy Pi Day, so happy 3.1415 and whatever numbers follow that. I, mean, I, I saw a documentary. Oh, man, it was probably 10 years ago uh, of this British kid that um, I, 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 I think he was autistic, right? And uh, came through it, but had his brain altered, and now he's like the smartest guy in the world. I think that's what it was called, the smartest guy in the world. This guy could write out pi accurately for the rest of his life. <laughs> he, he wrote out millions of digits, and they confirmed it, right? They had a whole 10 or 20 people with computers sitting there confirming, and he, and he didn't mess up, and he could have just kept on going. That's incredible. Me? 3.1415, that's as far as I go. Happy Pi Day. Don't forget to check out all of our sponsors. Life Change Tea, get the tea.com, River Moon Coffee, Studio Dome Speakers. Click on their banners over at jimmychurchradio.com. Use the promo codes for discounts and free shipping. Rumor has it River Moon Coffee is going to be a contact in the desert. Now that I just said that, they have to be at contact in the desert, Right? Wouldn't you love to just walk up to the fade to black booth, you know, come up and hang out with us in the fader knots and then look next door and see a river moon coffee booth serving river moon coffee fade to black blend on tap. How cool would that be? So there you go. River moon coffee. I just announced it. You don't have a choice. You're coming to God that too. They're going to be there regardless. But wouldn't that be cool? That was the one thing about Contact in the Desert. It's such a perfect event. The one thing that you have to do every morning is go on that coffee search. And if we have River Moon Coffee there this year, can you imagine the line 
oh man, it's going to be cool. River Moon Coffee will be at Contact in the Desert, which is coming up May 19th through the 22nd in Joshua Tree, California. Tickets and info over at jimmychurchradio.com. We're also giving away passes. You can enter the contest on our website. Click on the contest banner. The pass is non-transferable. If you win a pass and cannot attend, let us know. We'll draw another name. Thank you, and good luck to all of you fader knots. Let's get this show cracking. As you know, night vision gear is on our wish list. Along with all of you fader knots, we all want that night vision gear, right? So with that... Because we're shopping, and I have friends that are shopping right now. So I want to know. I'm going to defer this to you, Fader Knots, and to Twitter. And, and you can email me, too. What is the best brand, the tech level, the gen level, and model if, say, I were in the market right now? You know, like shopping on Amazon and getting ready to pull the trigger, man. I got mouse in hand. What is the best buy, the best bargain versus tech versus brand and everything else? Where should we go? All right, so help me out. Post it. And uh, we're, we're night vision shopping. I just, got, uh, uh, <laughs> I just got a tweet from Rita. What are you doing? Who said I, who said I would let you buy night vision? Right? I want to know. Okay. Rita says, uh, also, I need more lights. Do I need more lights in here? I'll do it on the break. Uh, I've got more studio lights over there. And I was hoping I could actually get away with less lights because, man, it's hot and it's it's a radio studio, man. It's not a TV studio. We're turning this into like Mike Douglas, man, or Johnny Carson, Jimmy Kimmel. All right. I need to know what the best night vision is out there. All right, today, happy birthday to Michael Caine is 84. Billy Crystal is 69. Mime is money. Billy Crystal is 69. Mime is money. Show me, Fader Knots, in Twitter right now what movie that quote is from. Impress me. I know you can do it. Quincy Jones today is 84. Our dead guy's birthday today is... Albert Einstein, 1879 to 1955, died at the age of 76. E equals MC square. That is all. On this day in history, OTD, 1950, the FBI debuts the 10 most wanted list. That's right. And tonight we have John DeSouzon, FBI. I wonder, I wonder if those FBI guys actually like walk around with the with the 10 most wanted list, like in their pocket, you know, because if they saw somebody like at a Starbucks, they go to Starbucks. Trust me. Justin says, Rita, he says, the bunker is supposed to be dark. Rita says, I'm all pixelated. Am I all pixelated? I don't know. I don't know. All right. Now, just listen. Tonight, we have John D'Souza on the X-Man, 20-year FBI agent. He's now an ET investigator. We're going to go in really hard tonight on this subject, and we need to. Tomorrow night, Linda Moulton Howe, and we're going to talk about what's going on in Antarctica, Alaska, with these pyramids. Thursday night is John Rappaport in the No More Fake Newsroom Live. I've been, I need to talk to you for a second, and I've got a lot on my mind here. And I've, so I'm going to go rapid fire. Okay, I'm going to go rapid fire. I've got to get these thoughts in. Because I've been talking about smart things around your house that may be listening or recording, both audio and video. What may be, you know, your very private moments that you don't want shared with anyone. Maybe you don't even want to share it with yourself. Like in ever, ever, right? Now, what is, to me, what is really funny here is that I think Kelly and Conway... You know who I'm talking about. Kellyanne Conway, I think that she, Trump, and the rest of the conspiracy squad in the Oval Office listen to this show or shows like this one. And to be honest, although that might sound cool on the surface, I just don't think they are smart enough to understand what I talk about. Seriously. 
when she went on and on about TVs used for wiretapping, microwaves that turn into holographic 3D universe communications with our ET overlords, all that dribble, well, you know, whatever. And and you listen to this stuff, and it just makes you wonder about the conversations they are having in the Oval Office. What is going on? It kind of sounds like fun, really, if you think about it. Sean Spicer saying, and I'm going to quote, man, this is Sean, press conference. Well, yeah, man, dude, well, yeah, we said wiretapping, but what we really meant was wiretapping, but not with wires. What we meant was, you know, like plasma beam, photon energy based alien technology, you know, like they used in Star Trek back in 68. That's what we were talking about. We were talking about wiretapping. We were talking about wiretapping. Seriously, this is what's being discussed right now in the Oval Office. And I know it sounds cool. But I just got to say, good luck with that, because it is not what is most important. What is important is the Internet of Things case that I first talked about a few months ago. And remember, what I've talked about is all of the smart things around your house. You know, those things that are open to hacking, the refrigerators, the the washer and dryer, your, your electric toothbrush. Your, your new Internet of Things mirror in the bathroom that are open to hacking, recording, and remote control. So, Kelly Ann and the rest of your buddies up there, please listen to me. This should clear things up. On November, on a November 2015 morning in Bentonville, Arkansas, first responders discovered a corpse floating in a hot tub. The home's resident, one James Andrew Bates, told authorities that he'd found the body of Victor Collins dead. That morning, he had gone to bed about 1 a.m. while Collins and another friend stayed up drinking. Well, this past December, the information reported that authorities had subpoenaed Amazon over the case. The police were considering Bates a suspect in what they suspected was a murder after signs of a struggle were found at the scene. So they hoped his echo, his Amazon echo, might hold some insights into what happened the night before. And it raises a zillion questions, and I've raised them all on this show. First off, what is an echo? An echo is a hands-free voice control device that uses Alexa to play music to control smart home devices, provide information, maybe even read you the news. But it also is recording everything you do all day long. Even when you tell it not to, think about that. It is always recording to the cloud. Nice. Amazon initially pushed back against the request, citing First Amendment protections, but ultimately conceded when Bates himself agreed to allow for the information to be handed over to the police. While Amazon's fight has been rendered moot, and I love that word, this case lays groundwork for some tough and important conversations to come, raising fascinating questions around the technologies that I've been talking about on this show, Kellyanne. Well, for me, it's like the perfect test case. What do devices like the Echo or Google Home actually record and save? Have we as consumers effectively surrendered a reasonable right to privacy? Think about that. A reasonable right to privacy from corporations and the government by bringing such devices into your home. If you buy it and you bring it home, you've surrendered. Alexa is only one of the few devices in Bates' house, by the way. I don't know if all of them were recording, but if you were going to set up a hypothetical situation to decide if the Internet of Things could be used as an investigative tool, you've got this mysterious hot tub murder in Arkansas. So, here we go. 
The question of how much privacy we can reasonably expect when installing some of these home assistants, it's getting complex and it is unresolved. In a sense, people who buy an Echo or home, what they're getting themselves into from the very basic fact that they've purchased an internet connected device with built in microphones and it is designed to always, always be listening. It's created by companies that thrive on tailoring ads and, and data on the buttloads of data they collect from you. Think about this. Still, constant recording and storage is another question entirely, and this is what I need to drive home. Home assistants, like Echo, are designed to have an ear open at all times. Think about that. It doesn't matter if it's a TV, your refrigerator. It doesn't matter. They are on all the time listening for your voice. They're monitoring the surroundings. They're looking for keywords like Alexa, Google, or Siri, right? Allegedly. There could be other keywords. More on that in a second. But once a user consents by introducing such a device into their home, and that's where it becomes consensual, are its manufacturers bound by law only to record and store the information their products were designed to act upon? And this is completely unclear, and they are not being truthful with us. We don't know. More importantly, or even crazier, has the consumer effectively waived those rights? Kellyanne, Oval Office, are you listening? These devices are always on, listening for you to say something. It's listening for trigger words. What those trigger words are, we don't know. And the list gets bigger, longer, and more intelligent in the cloud with God knows what software. 24 hours a day, it doesn't rest. Think about this scenario. You have a dinner party, and you have some smart friends over, friends that are in tune. They know what's going on. And in the background, Echo is listening. Trigger words are said. The recording starts. And the nightmare begins. Did somebody say bomb? Think about it. Seriously. Then you hear that knock at the door and the megaphone blares out. We've got this place surrounded. Your neighbors are out in front saying, he was such a nice boy. He used to take out my garbage. Well, the other scenario is this. You let your dinner guests know about the echo in the room. Guaranteed at that point, you will have the most boring conversation ever in the history of dinner parties. The only way to save the intelligent give and take at the dinner table is to walk over and unplug the echo in front of your guests so they can relax. Think about it. There is the risk, of course, of confusion and disclosure. Early last month, Samsung's language in the privacy policy for its smart TVs Sure made it sound to me like the company was going out of its way to capture and transmit sensitive information. I read this to you last month. I'm going to read it to you again today. I'm quoting from Samsung. Please be aware that if your spoken words include personal or other sensitive information, that information will be among the data captured and transmitted to a third party through your use of voice recognition. End quote. Think about that. And then we have, earlier this week, WikiLeaks detailed a secret spying operation on behalf of the CIA and British intelligence that allowed Samsung smart TVs to spy on users when the sets appeared to be off. Google says this, out of, out of everything, and Samsung is, is still trying to backpedal off of this, and everything else, man, with exploding cell phones, and they've got issues right now in Samsung. What's going on in South Korea right now? They've got no president, right? Things are crazy over in South Korea. But Google tops it all. 
This is what they say about their devices. And again, I'm quoting from their own literature. Quote, if the hot word is recognized, the data, including the query contents, are sent to Google servers for analyzing and storage in my activity. (laughs) What's the hot words? What is triggering the recording? Now, they're going to say one thing. But what 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 can be used without you knowing, that's that's a whole nother thing. We only know what Google tells us. We only know what Samsung tells us. We only know what Amazon tells us. What these trigger words are and the fact that the CIA is using these devices to spy on people, those trigger words could be anything like bomb. So it makes me wonder, and this is this is where I trip out. What made Trump and his staff jump on this wiretapping claim? Something was said. Something was said. Something was said in a private setting. Something was said that only they or he knew about. And whatever that information was, it got back to them. So the first thing in their conspiracy-minded Oval Office that they now have in Washington, D.C., which is fine, but this is where they are off base because of shows like this. They find out that somebody heard their conversation. So Trump immediately says, Obama was wiretapping us. No, it was probably your echo, Donald Trump. It was probably Kellyanne watching a Samsung TV in Trump Tower. It was you spying on yourself. And that's the world that we live in today. So as you walk around your house and you buy all of these nice smart devices, your uh, your Echo, your home, your smart toothbrush, your smart mirror, your smart TV, your smart refrigerator, your smart underwear, whatever it is, Think about what you're giving up because something is going to happen in the future that you're going to be very embarrassed about. And I'm not saying it's going to be a murder rap. It could be something else and it's going to come back. So tape over the bunker cam. You bet. This is fade to black. You are so welcome. Think about that. It's a different world. It's a different world. We're going to talk about all of this tonight with John D'Souza. 20-year FBI veteran, and he's now an ET investigator and author. The Real X-Files, he is the X-Man. This is Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and KGRA The Planet. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Follow me on Twitter at jchurchradio. Email is jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. I'll be right back after this short break with John D'Souza. Stay right there. Listening to Jimmy Church fade to black. Fade to black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black. You create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the Fade to Black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of Fade to Black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2B Blend for 15% off of your order today. 
Go back, Lee Tappy. Hi, folks. Let's wind the clocks back 60 years. Food was different. Food provided health and nutrition, and using supplements was minimal. Unfortunately, now we have chemicals, GMOs, herbicides, and pesticides that can be quite lethal in the name of our food supply and, of course, the ever-loving dollar. Supplementing our diets can be very important to stay healthy. Cleansing from daily intruders to the body might be critical. Live strong and take charge. Log on to GetTheTea.com. Our herbal tea is a great way to cleanse from intruders. Our supplements is a great way to maintain and improve your health. When your health is not up to par, go to GetTheTea.com. No GMOs, no fillers, and organic. And very helpful in keeping you at the top of your game. Life is too short to feel, uh, you know what I mean. Stay in the game. At the top of your game with GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Again, GetTheTea.com. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show. On the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the planet. Hi, this is Chase Kletsky with Fate Magazine Radio, and you're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA digital broadcast station, where the Fader Knots rock. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Manson, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. All right, welcome back, Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Want to remind everybody, tomorrow night, right here, Linda Moulton Howe. Going to light it up like we do every time she is on the show. It's going to be great. Thursday night, Fader night, John Rappaport and his No More Fake Newsroom Live. Tonight, John D'Souza, the X-Man. John was an FBI agent for over 20 years and worked in the global war on terrorism and violent crimes. And also during that time, he collected the real X-Files. D'Souza unravels mysteries that elude investigators restricted to the purely material world. The truth of the paranormal revealed itself to the author through his own supernatural experiences. We're going to discuss all of that tonight. And those of others across many professional fields. Today, he is revealing these stories as a leading researcher and writer on the paranormal. He was an attorney and an investigator who maintained a top security clearance for many years. His background infused him with the ability to decipher mysteries that are beyond conventional abilities or mine. Of course, his website is johntamabooks.com. The links are over at jimmychurchradio.com. I would like to welcome, for the first time, to Fade to Black, John D'Souza. John, welcome to the show. How are you? Oh, thank you, Jimmy. I am doing great. This is such an honor to be on your show here with the Game Changer Network on Fade to Black. Well, you know know the drill, man. You get the first-time guest (laughs) disclaimer tonight. Yes, I'm ready. Are you ready? It's just you and I, John, sitting on my couch having a conversation as friends. Where the conversation starts, it starts. Where it ends, it ends. But we're going to end as friends. Are you ready? I am ready. Okay. Uh, you know, with you, and this is this is really the truth, we can go in so many different areas. And and I don't know, uh, well, I'm, we're going to start backwards and work forwards uh, in a conventional sense. But I don't know if you heard my little rant at the beginning of the show tonight. I but, did. Okay. So, you know, uh, and you're on top of the news. The the questions of surveillance and the uh, the NSA, the CIA, the FBI certainly is part of that mix. All of those three uh, letter agencies are, um, and the big reveal from WikiLeaks, and then we uh, coming off of the heels of Snowden, um, this government surveillance, and now the talk in Washington uh, um, amongst the bureaucrats to actually start using the words shadow government now what that says to me john is that us 
and I'm not referring to you, you're, you're, you're getting into our circle, but let's just say <laughs> us that, uh, um, we've been talking about this for years, right? Good. And, and now it is, uh, we are the normal ones and it's the rest of the world that is off kilter here. They're starting to wake up to the things that we've been talking about for a very, very long time. Has this government surveillance in, in with your experience been just like it is being painted now? Has this been going on? Yeah, and I, I believe it's much worse than people dare think about because basically I believe everything is being collected on us as American citizens. And whether you're talking about our texts, our emails, our communications, our phone conversations, everything is being collected. Now, who is actually collecting it? It can change in diff depending on the situation, but it's all being collected. It's all being stored. It can't be analyzed at the moment, but when someone is uh, decided to be an enemy of the global structure, then uh, that particular target, that particular person, they can go and data mine all of their stuff and bring it all back to use for attacks. And there's lots of people out there who have experienced exactly this, and they know they know what I'm talking about. So people have to assume, at, and this is why it's so important to fight against tyranny at any, at all the levels, because stuff is all being collected at this point. And one of the great, one of the, I believe, one of the great uh, tricks that are done is that even if people domestically are not collecting uh, directly against uh, the citizens, all the national security agencies of all over the world are collecting on each other's citizens anyway. And instead of agencies saying, hey, that's wrong, you know, we're going to get you in trouble for collecting against our citizens and storing. All. Instead, I think, I believe what goes on is that they just share the information when they need to. And that's, that's, the, that's the really, really uh, alarming part. And most people believe, a lot of people believe that, hey, that's not, that's not my problem because I don't ever do anything wrong in my texts and my emails right, and my right. phone calls. But it is your problem because when you function under the same tyrannical uh, surveillance state that has started against all of us after 2001, after well, it really got going after 2001, when you function under that, then anything that's collected against your neighbor can then later on, if you are targeted for whatever reason, who knows what reason, it can then be placed on you. And it can be said, you did these, the metadata can be changed. The metadata can be adjusted. And because you only need to go back as far as the Soviet Union to see things like that, where their own citizens were framed for crimes that they never committed. They were ascribed to mental illness that they didn't suffer from. Uh, all kinds of tyrannical persecutions that went on in the 20th century against people by their own governments. And you don't have to go very far to see that. Now, imagine the same tyrannical attitude, but with with uh, next generation technology that we just can't, we just can't imagine, because it's amazing stuff like you like you talked about, Jimmy. Uh, stuff that involves microwaves and television appliances. Right, right. Well, okay. Uh, let me apply this to you uh, directly because this can also flip uh, onto somebody like you. When did you leave the FBI? What I year? Was about about f four years ago. Okay, so four years. Twenty thirteen. Okay. Oh, that's a that's the perfect answer. Okay, so in 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 midst of all of this technology, so you left in two thousand thirteen. You're on this show tonight that uh, not only deals with conspiracies but a lot of controversial subjects, and you are an ex agent of the FBI. You coming on this show could open you up to your data mining history right is there are you nervous about that and and if they wanted to couldn't they just go back and 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 take a look at what you were doing in your living room in 2012 uh, that's an excellent point now i would say i would say no that is not something that i'm concerned about because one of the things that i always 
say to people, and whether in my books or in person, I always say to people, there's no need to violate secrecy oaths, to violate uh, confidentiality agreements. There's no need to do any of that stuff. Because one of the great uh, thesis, the main hypothesis of my work is that now that we're in, and this is something that global controllers don't want us to understand or articulate. And it is that we now are in the information age. We are in an information society. And basically, we've gone, we've, we're on the precipice. We've crossed the Rubicon from the secrecy society to the information society. Right, right. Government can no longer keep events secret. They can't. They're, they just, national governments, I'm not just talking about the United States, I'm talking about every national government. They have no ability to keep, because there's just too many with the with the internet the way it is and with our state of technology the way it is there's just too many inroads too many ingresses to to the cybersphere there's they cannot keep the stuff secret anymore you can keep a communication secret you can market whatever top secret you know if i if i decide to write to you uh, Jimmy, hey, uh, you're a government worker. I'm a government. Hey, great job on the JFK assassination. I'm so glad of what you did there. Right. I'm so proud of you. Uh, I can mark that secret. I can mark that compartmentalized. I can mark it with all these extraordinary markings and say, okay, keep this secret for the next 40 years. Uh, and then even beyond that, you can keep it secret. But the event, what happens and who's involved and what happens, that stuff, no one can keep that stuff secret anymore. So they're really... We've now gone to a completely different system. And so now the global controllers use what I call and what I what I write about called data flooding. And instead of trying to keep the stuff secret from you, what they're doing is they're showering us with too much information. And a lot of it bogus information, a lot of it superfluous, a lot of it, but it's just we're being inundated with huge amounts of information on all of these topics that they used to try to keep secret from us because the secrecy society, it's, it's not working. And in this age, it just doesn't work anymore. So yeah, I, I personally never uh, use secret information. I don't, I never, if I always tell people, don't send me anything secret, don't, don't send me anything sensitive mm -hmm. or confidential. I'll tear it up. I'll delete it. I'll get rid of it because I don't need it. There's so much information in the cybersphere. And I was a technocrat, uh, when I was, uh, when I was with the FBI. So I, I know some of this, I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, uh, through the roof expert, but I do have some facility with these technology systems, and it's just obvious to me that we can all we can all data mine. We can use some of the same methods that are used against us. We can data mine the truth from open sources. Open sources. The stuff is all out there. Yes, it is. And it is. It is. When I vet somebody or a name or I've got an address, uh, or I, it is amazing what you can do with a mouse. It is, it's, it's truly, you can go pretty deep on just uh, public information that is out there. And uh, it's, it's something that I use daily. And you're absolutely right. I'm afraid about what's out there, you know, my information and my family's information too as well. Well, let me ask you this. Um, how free, I want to know where I can go tonight. How free are you to speak I mean, can I ask you any, are there any restrictions on what you can talk about? Uh, well, I always, I always uh, make sure to use only open source information. I never reveal anything that's uh, covered no. under. No, 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 that's not what I'm referring to. I'm, I'm saying I, I'm going to start to ask you some questions about the FBI. How free oh, are you to talk about that? Oh no, I can I can talk to you about anything. Okay. Anything all right. All right. Here we go. First question. <laughs> With a top secret clearance, and I've heard about this uh from so many different sources with different information. It's top secret clearance, is there another level of top secret above that or is it just just top secret that you get one clearance and that's it? I get asked that all the time. Uh there <laughs> Technically, well, the answer is yes and no, and I'll tell you why. 
uh, there is when you when you go into any area of any any national government or intelligence agency, uh, the they give you the top secret clearance, and that uh, I believe every every uh, FBI agent gets that clearance, uh, and that is basically the highest uh, level that there is. However, there are many many other classifications that are not necessarily up above. Uh, top secret in a vertical sense, but they are lateral. They are sideways compartmentalized, you see. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, so if I want, if I'm working as, let's say I'm a government executive and I'm working a secret project that I don't want congressmen to be able to see, uh, that's very easy to do. And I don't need, because the congressman can have the top secret clearance. But if I want to stop him from seeing this particular project, mm -hmm. all you got to do is get a classifying authority and classify it on, under one of the compartmentalized uh, titles, which there are many of those. There are many of those. And they are not, so theoretically, they are not above top secret. They are lateral to top secret, but they are sealed up like a drum. Like, so imagine like a bunch of drums sitting by the main pyramid. The main pyramid is top secret, but all these drums that are all around the pyramid of top secret are compartmentalized and they all have different, they can have different names, a lot of different names and titles, but they are sealed up tight. And if you don't have a need to know that you can demonstrate, then those particular areas are completely sealed off from even and it doesn't matter who you are you you may not be able to break in to that drum to see those areas now you're investigating somebody and you uh, do you have the ability to immediately uh without warrant right without a warrant without going to a judge or going to a court to get something signed off can you uh immediately also look into their neighbors or their friends list or everybody that is connected to them. Can, can you do that without a warrant? Well, it's not a question of having a warrant. There are safeguards uh, and, and the, uh, and the FBI is a very rigid, uh, by the book sort of organization. This is, you know, I don't know about other organizations, but the FBI is very much by the book, and we and they have all kinds of oversights, so that the warrant process is an oversight. That's something so that a judge has some kind of supervision over what the freak you are doing in an investigation. However, the FBI itself has so many other uh, oversights uh, internally internally as well as externally that they place that really the warrant process uh isn't isn't the most important oversight that they have they've got lots of over other oversights and they enforce them very strictly so that if you're if i if i am looking into if someone is looking into somebody they have to do they have to finish their investigation within a certain amount of time they have very strict limits on what type of material they can look at concerning the person, depending on the severity of the crime that is involved or the, or the violation that's involved. So they have a lot of, a lot of oversights, but you know, I don't know if, you know, the FBI is not the only organization out there looking into people's stuff. Uh, but as far as they go, they're, they're very, very, uh, supervised. Let's put it that way. Now, and then we have the other complication today. I think my take on the FBI is a, is a general one and is a status quo type of view, which is that the FBI was tight. It was private. They, you, didn't, you didn't know the FBI was looking at you until they came at you, right? And they, <laughs> that was, they, you didn't know what they were doing. All the investigations were, you know, today it seems like the FBI is almost, has been externaled. Like we know what they are doing now. Is, is this the product of today? Uh, you know, is this the J. Edgar Hoover days over with? And, and now it's almost a public organization where we know everything. And is that, the way it should be. I'm, I'm uncomfortable with it. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, I've always, I've always seen them 
and you know, I wasn't uh, I wasn't around in the organization during the J. Edgar Hoover uh, era, uh, and maybe they did things in a very different way uh, during that time. But in the post uh, era, in in the organization, uh, all I've seen is that they've been they've been very open, oh, very open uh, with people as far as what they do, and open as far as questioning people openly when they have something that's dealing with that person as far as i mean as much as they could so that's how i that's how i have seen them operate and have operated with them as far as that goes and that's always been how i've seen it uh, so i don't really see that uh, that sort of uh, secretive especially because most of the stuff they deal with is criminal in nature it's going to be it's going to be public at some point so that's that's how i see it so the stuff that went on with investigations, and I'm talking about Hillary or this wiretapping that's going on now, I don't deal with politics on the show. I, I don't. I don't care about it. Uh, but the conspiracy of the politics that is running the machine behind it is fascinating, and I will always talk yeah. about it. And so when, when this kind of... Uh, politicizing of the FBI yes. started to surface. I, I'm not comfortable with that. I didn't know that politics could start pushing the FBI around. I always thought right. that the FBI didn't care who was in the Oval Office, that, you know, the FBI right. is doing their own thing and they will investigate the Oval Office if they have to. Right. Right. So and ideally, that's the way it should be. And that's the way it's always been, actually. So I also not comfortable with uh, politicizing. I've always been uh, a field agent in the field, and I was never involved with the uh, leadership structure of the organization. And, and that was on purpose. The, one of the reasons for that is because I did not want to get involved in political uh, caboose pulling uh, of the organization. And But I never dreamed that that politicizing would get to the levels that it is today. It's very... Uh, it's uh, very sad. It's very sad. And I don't like to see that, but that's, that's not what the organization was made to do. That's not what they're good at. And uh, it's unfortunate, but that's the way it is right now. Well, we're going to head towards a break in five minutes. So let's, uh, let's kind of set up what we're going to do after the break. Uh, the X-Files, one, uh, one of the great shows, great series on television. I've binged it uh, and, and actually binged it again just recently, too, as well, and went back and, and plowed through whatever nine seasons back-to-back. Uh, -back. Uh, yes, I admit it. I did it. <laughs> now, um, and what is curious uh, to me is the... Some of the evidence out there that the X files are real, that the that there are files that have the big X stamped on it for whatever reason, because it couldn't be handled anywhere else in the agency. They didn't know what to do with it. It gets cast, you know, into this room and forgotten about. Right. Um, and there is some evidence of that and the vault and so forth. I've been all over the vault and and, <laughs> and fascinated with it. Um and we don't even need to talk about that tonight. But some of those files in the vault were stamped X. So the question is a, a general one. But is there a, a, a file cabinet somewhere in the J. Edgar Hoover building uh, that is full of X files? As far as I know, I don't believe that there are. Uh, but what I do believe is that there are there are cases and files that do have paranormal impact in them and for the most part they tend to be classified as closed and undetermined that's what i have seen that's what i've seen throughout my throughout my time in the fbi i don't think there's a separate section for it uh but I do believe they are they are there, and they do tend to be gotten rid of pretty quickly with as with as little as little uh, observation and oversight as possible. That's what I've seen. Well, you have said uh, that during that time, during your time at the FBI, that you collected the real life X files. 
Um, can you explain that and and why you term it in in that fashion? Sure. The uh, real life X Files are cases that have uh, actual paranormal elements to them, and it's just there's just no other way to describe them. And I can tell you that the first one that I really came across was right after 2001. It was the one I write about in my book, The Power Investigators. And it was the case that I, the one that I call Indigo Kids, the Indigo Kids of 9-11. That's what it's called. And it's basically the story of all these kids. Um, in 2001, we had the terrorist act against Twin Towers that took down the Twin Towers. But in the weeks uh, before the actual event, there were young kids all over the country, uh, kids as young as four, uh, going all the way up to like 11 years old, uh, 12 years old, uh, all over the country who were having visions and dreams and experiences of an event like 9-11. Uh, and the only reason that anyone found out about these things is because once 9-11 happened, there was all the see something, say something. There was all the, you know, report anything at all. And we've got to we've got to track it down. We got to see what happened. And all these kids were reported by caretakers, babysitters, uh, bus drivers, uh, people who were in in care of these children. Uh, we had one little girl who was on a playground, who uh, had a teacher check or check on her. She was sitting by herself, not playing with anybody. Are you okay? And the little girl said, Oh, I'm fine. I'm just thinking. And the teacher goes to walk away. Little girl pulls on her skirt violently and tells her, tomorrow, make sure you stay away from tall buildings because tall buildings can fall down wow. and they can fall on people. Uh, another little boy who's in his class and he's drawing a beautiful finger painting. Teacher comes over to him, says, oh, this painting is very lovely. Wow, this beautiful. These buildings are glowing. And these there's like angels with these big red wings just flying out of these buildings. You know, where are they flying to? And the little boy says, uh, those buildings aren't glowing. They're on fire. And those people, those aren't angels. Those are people, and those aren't wings. Those are that's fire. Those people are on fire, and they're jumping out of the buildings. Okay, so teacher will walk away from something like that and just chalk it up to, you know, kids didn't get enough sleep or too much candy, right? Something right. like that. But once 9/11 happens, a lot of these incidences were reported, and these kids had to be interviewed uh, uh, by big strapping law enforcement officers. That's crazy. Yeah. That yeah. is nuts. Okay, how? Okay, uh, let me. I've, I've got thirty seconds. Um, how did the FBI start to approach that? I mean, now we are dealing with uh, hardcore paranormal. That is Mulder yeah. and 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 Scully, right? Full yeah. tilt boogie. Yes. Uh, how did they approach that? Was it paranormal? Was it you know? Uh, what was the cover sheet in that file? I mean, I can. The <laughs> oh, the cover sheet was these interviews must be done with 100% completion rate, no matter what, in order to wash out the possibility of connection of these families to terrorism. That's it. That's it. No exceptions. Doesn't matter how young the kid was. Wow. It doesn't matter what you personally think. You've got to go out there. You've got to do these interviews. And you've got to wash this out. Basically, is what it's what it comes down to, uh, because there's always that possibility. Well, they believe there was a possibility that this child could have overheard something from a family member. Right, 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 right. Got right. the impression from adults and so forth. So that was the reason why it had to be covered, no matter what. Oh, let's take a break right here. Wow, wow, wow. Wow, that's all I got to say, John, is wow. Okay, we'll pick that up on the backside. And Twitter is completely on fire, and I will try to get these questions in, too, as well. Thank you for that, Fade or Not. Our guest tonight, John D'Souza, the X-Man. 20 years in the FBI, turned ET investigator. I'll be right back. Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. The station that talks the net, KGRA Radio. Hello, I'm Katini, and you're listening to my main man, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. 
Hi, this is Ray Sobs here, repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church. Fade to black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're of the Honey Brothers. Well, the... <laughs> yes. We are of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. What's up, Fade or Nots? Studio Dumb loves Fade to Black and the F2B audience so much that they have put together the ultimate stereo Bluetooth system. They've done it just for you. Man, check this out. The Studio Dome SBB2 stereo system is here. It's featuring two Studio Boombox 2 SBB2 wireless Bluetooth speakers packed in its own custom hard shell case. This Studio Dome system features the very latest in stereo Bluetooth technology. The two full-range boomboxes are in true wireless stereo. You've got to hear this. It's amazing. It's just $129, and use the promo code JCRTWS, and you'll also get free shipping. It's simple. Just go to JimmyChurchRadio.com, click on the Studio Dome banner. Go back, Lee Tappy. Balance of Nature's Fruits and Veggies. I was diagnosed with congestive heart failure. I went from being able to work 14, 16 hours a day with no problem to where I could barely walk a block to the store. I went on to the phytonutrients about six months ago, and within a couple of months, my medical doctor had cut my prescriptions down in a a little bit smaller dosage. The next time I went back a month later, I walked into the doctor's office, and he says, my gosh, what's happened to you? You don't even look like the same person. He looked at my legs and the swelling had gone down. My blood pressure was down. The venous stasis ulcers that I had had on my legs for the last four or five years because of the poor circulation were all healed, and I'm feeling far better. The new challenge will allow you to receive two months of Balance of Nature's fruits and veggies free, and we'll even ship them to you free. Call now for details. Call 1-800-2468-751. Or go online to balanceofnature.com. Use promo code TALK. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black. Across the globe on the Game Changer Radio Network and the one and only KGRA Radio, The Planet. Welcome back. This portion of Fade to Black is brought to you by River Moon Coffee. Makers of the Fade to Black blend. That's right. It's dark, complex, and smoky. That's right. Just go to the River Moon Coffee banner right now over on our site. Use the promo code F2B blend and you will get 15% off of your order because you know somebody. Our guest tonight, John D'Souza, he's an FBI agent, 20 years with the agency, and today he is the X-Man. He's an author, he's an ET investigator, and he's got some pretty interesting takes on the ET and alien phenomenon, and we're going to get to all of that tonight, and we will get to your calls. And John, before we move forward, I want to step backwards uh, to the Indigo Children um, uh, interviews, because John just said in Twitter, and he's right, what were the conclusions? How did you guys close that file out? What did you think was going on? Oh, they all closed out the same exact way. Uh, Determination of no connection to terrorism made uh, between these families and Terror and international terrorism, and kids just had a bad dream. They just had a uh, so basically, like I said before, undetermined and closed. They were just when it so when it comes to something like that, the paranormal, right? Which is the conclusion they should have come to. They went with the man, the black and white side of it. Exactly. Why do you? Why? 
I, you know, shouldn't there be some curiosity here as to what is actually going on? But what well, sure. are you suggesting? Yeah. I'm sorry to cut you off. Are you suggesting that once there was no connection to terrorism directly, they weren't overhearing family members plotting this out? They just washed their hands of it. Yeah, well, they had to because that was the limited purpose and ability that they had at that moment. Like I said before, the uh, the uh, FBI is a very heavily oversighted uh, organization as far as our procedures. Uh, so that's it. I mean, you cannot uh, you cannot uh, say, "Hey, I want to keep this open because there's some kind of paranormal thing going on here." So let me look deeper into this. Uh, you can't do that sort of thing because there's a, there's so many safeguards in place to make sure that you're not just saying that as an investigator just because you want to really pin something on these people you see <laughs> so right in a way it's a good thing well um you had uh, a, a, a ufo uh contact experience when you were nine years i think nine right nine yeah yeah and now when you we're going to talk about that now but yeah. when you were brought into the agency you didn't bring that up did you Oh no! Absolutely not. Right. <laughs> right. And it was not. And it was not asked. It wasn't on the forms or the psych uh, evaluations or all the many, many other you know sort of background type things that they do to let you into the organization. So, hey, if they're not asking, I'm not answering on that. Well, the reason why I ask, I um, ah, oh, this is 2017. So let's say about 10 years ago. Um, and I'm not going to go into any details, but let's just say this. I had to go and do an interview with one of the three letter agencies. Okay. All right. That's all I'm going to say what it was about. <laughs> I, it, it, seriously, it's a, it, it's, it's a, a, a heavy matter had nothing to do with me, but, but anyway, I was called and asked to come and have a conversation, right? And I said, okay, all right, uh, I'll do it. And they said, <laughs> I'm not making this up. Damn, you're uh, we're, a good citizen. Uh, we're, gonna, we're going to uh, meet at a Starbucks. And I said, okay. And they told me which, which was near my house. And I thought, okay, that's uh, okay. So I go. And, and I'm wondering what dude looks like, right? So I walk into the Starbucks, and I look for his car outside, right? Didn't see any government cars. And so I walk in, and I look around, and there he is sitting, like, I mean, the pink elephant in the room, right? The elephant in the room. And he looked like a spook, right? I mean, he, gray suit, you know, the, the whole thing sitting there by himself. And I thought, man... I hope nobody sees me talking to these, you know. So anyway, so I sit down, and the first thing I said to this guy was, dude, do you all look like this, right? <laughs> <laughs> and his answer was, yeah, pretty much, this is the uniform. And I said, okay, where's your car? And he goes, uh, it's parked uh, around the block. I would never park no, anywhere. I said, oh, smart. okay, all right. Smart. So, yeah, so when um, when I left, um, and this is a question directly at you, by the way. So when I used I'd, to do that, too, by the way. It, it, parked my car. Yeah, a couple of it was trippy. So when I left, I wanted him to leave first because I wanted to see his car. And we had this little standoff, and he goes, no, you can go ahead and leave. And I was like, oh, man. So I, I left. I sit outside my car. He did not come out. He stayed in there. I had to leave. And I assume then he left after that. So I didn't get to see his car, his plates. I, I, I do have his business card, though. Um, one day when we meet, I will show it to you and you will flip out. Now, oh, no, we got a prank call. But we'll yeah, right, right. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I don't know if you would prank call this guy. But did you look like that? Did you have the agency look you know, did you look 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 like an FBI agent? Yes, we all tend to dress the same and look the same. It's a it's a culture. I mean, it I, is, isn't it? It's a it's a whole it's a whole culture unto its own. And you know, that's something I found out at a very young age. I mean, I was recruited at a very young age into the organization, and I was I started at the position of special agent. I would say around 25, 20, 24, 25 years old. And they don't hire people that young anymore that 
position uh, because it doesn't it doesn't work out very often. Now the average age that they hire people is like 32, and it's usually it's usually a a second career. For yeah, most. professional. Right, right, right. They, they've they got to, they've got yeah. a specialty uh, to right. them. Um, now with you, and I want to uh, make this really quick. Uh, because I want to discuss the events uh, when you were nine and, and, and move forward. How did you apply? How do you apply for the FBI? I think of the movie I, Taxi Driver with De Niro, you know, when he walks up to the Secret Service agent, right? He's like, hey, man, I want, I want to be one of you guys. I uh, wouldn't. I wouldn't know. Oh, uh, just real quick, I wanted to tell you. Yeah, we are. They are very sensitive. We're very sensitive to having our pa- our plates, our car plates, picked up and copied by people. Not because you're going to get any information out of the pl- license plates, uh, the plates on our cars, uh, because those are backstopped. I mean, those are they're not going to come back to anything. But if you pick up our plates, then you can later on see the same car and you can be certain that it's our car again. So that's why we park like two blocks away so that you won't see that. Um, but to answer your other question, uh, I, I don't know too much about how you would initially apply because I was recruited. I actually, they actually had a recruiter that came to my law school where I was just in like my second year of law school right. and the recruiter came there and he kind of just zeroed in on me and we talked and he made things sound pretty amazing. It was like the old army recruiter. Hey son, you can go to new and interesting places, great places, and find out new and wonderful things about people and blah, blah, blah. So I was recruited right from my law school by a guy who was really uh, pretty sharp, and he made the organization sound wonderful, and it was. It really was. And so I then started the application process, but from a you know certain level. I mean, it wasn't like a cold walk into the agency and – and hey, I want to be like your new guy. Can I fill out some forms? Right. But uh, yeah, I think these days they actually start the initial process online. As long as you fill the requirements, you know, you got to have some kind of, you got to have your initial four year degree. You got to have your uh, sometimes advanced degree also helps. Um, you know, in my case, I was an attorney, uh, but there's other people who have their masters. They love uh, accountants, attorneys, uh, former teachers, military officers, that sort of thing. Those are some of their favorite categories to hire. Do you think you're being surveilled today or monitored at all? And do you, for instance, this show right now, do you think there is somebody listening because you are on this show? Uh, No, because what I talk about, and I've actually had discussions with the FBI about this, uh, because uh, because of my books and my books that I write on the and basically, as long as I'm as long as you're not a whistleblower and you don't want to talk about things that actually happen, and as long as I'm talking about the paranormal for the most part, uh, they really they really couldn't care less. Uh, because they see the world, government people see the world in very concrete terms. And it's a lot of, they're just completely materialistic. And so they, and materialistic in terms of if it's not, if it's not solid, if you're not talking about things that are solid and real, uh, as far as they're concerned, they just, they just don't care. They really don't. That's, and I found that out in conversations with them directly. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, I, I, I don't care. You know what I mean? I don't. I, I'm, I'm a public guy, right? I, I, there are certain things you just can't care about. But I just have to assume that they are listening. They have to. There's too many people that. And you and you should. Right, right. I, I just assume out of the gate. And and I, And I'll say this. When I did sports radio, right, when I did sports radio, I had no issues. I I mean, in a technical nature, the computers ran fine, the phone lines ran fine, internet, you know. I start doing this show and start having certain guests on, technical issues. The first time it happened, I got so upset because in the sports world, nothing, you know, nothing. I could talk about whatever. Who cares? And the first time we started to have technical issues, I lost my mind. Now, I just take it in stride. I, I have to. It, it just happens all the time. I know that that is what's going on. Um, okay, let's back up. You're nine years old. 
Um, and uh, you're living in New York. Uh, yeah. You uh, you know, I'll, I'll just cut all of this, you know, pretty short because I want to move on quickly. You're you're at a party. Uh, you're nine. You go outside and you look up and you see something very uh, strange in the sky. What did you see? Yeah, what I saw was I saw an area in the sky. I was between two of the tallest buildings I'd ever seen to that time in my life. I was only nine years old. And I was out in the night air there, and it was a very starry night, and I saw one spot above these two buildings that was inky darkness. In other words, couldn't see the stars. There was, for some reason, they were blotted out only in this one area above these two built tall buildings. And I kept looking at it and realized it was a cloud of, like, ink, sort of like uh, the kind of squid would put out in the water if you try to catch them with your hand. And it was a cloud of this black ink. And then suddenly from the bottom of that cloud, I saw a, like a flying saucer is the only way to say it, a sort of a flying saucer coming out the bottom of this inky cloud and with the light spinning in the bottom and it was coming down towards me. And then I was, uh, by this time I was on my feet because I had been laying on the ground because one kid punched me in the stomach uh, before they all ran away. And then I was standing up looking at it as it was coming down towards me. There were two teenage girls on my left side who were screaming at the top of their lungs. They were saying, the world's coming to an end, the world's coming to an end, mm -hmm. and then they were gone. Uh, then I felt like I was hit with a spotlight, like a kind of spotlight. And in that moment, I changed my mind, and the vehicle, the, the thing, whatever it was, changed its mind also. I took a step back, and it started going reverse course and started going right back up into the cloud. And it went into the cloud like a cartoon character. It just went into the cloud, and just like the cartoon character pulls the jumps in the hole, pulls a hole in after it, it went up into the cloud, and the cloud disappeared, and it was gone. That was it. Then you had, I, I've got a multitude of questions to stem off of that. We'll come back to that in a second. Then you had another uh, uh, direct contact um, in your bedroom. And before I say it was of the classic sense, it sort of was, but it was also different. Take us through those yeah. events. Yeah, I was, again, this happened shortly after the, uh, the experience I told you about right now. Uh, and in my home, and it's these experiences I write about in my book, The Extra Dimensionals. And what happened was, it was, I was in my home late at night. I was trying to stay up as late as I could, uh, doing that clock watching thing to see, because it was an amazing mystical thing to stay up late at night for some reason at that age. And so I watched the clock approach, I think it was like three in the morning. And it was, I suddenly, I felt like a cold vapor through the room. My body went stiff. And then uh, I had something, I felt something. I couldn't see anything because I was rigid. I was like a board. But I felt something lifting me up my, from my head, from my head and my feet, lifting me up, lifting me up. And I was like, a, I was floating like a balloon half filled with helium. And it was, I was being, I was being managed. I was being uh, ferried over to this area. Uh, higher and higher, and I was being ferried up towards the ceiling, and I couldn't tell what was really going on. I couldn't move. Was there uh, anybody I, else in the room with you, brothers, sisters, family? No. This was I was alone in this room on a, on a cot bed, on my own cot bed, but this room was juxtaposed. It was right across from my parents' bedroom, and I could see them at some point. I could see them over sleeping you know, on their bed because my door was my door leading into their bedroom was open. Okay. Was open. And so I was being ferried up towards the ceiling somehow. And it was they these beings that were carrying me appeared to me to be passing through the ceiling. And they were trying to do the same with me. But for some reason my forehead was stopping stopping my going through. And they kept trying, they kept trying, and they were bumping my forehead against the ceiling. And, my, and I wasn't going through, which they found very puzzling. And they kept stopping, they kept on, and, but it was almost like they were on ladders, but they weren't. They were floating as well as, just as much as I was, and they were standing on nothing, basically. Any and, communication, John? No, none. I had one moment, uh, as they were bumping my head, 
I became more and more able to move a little bit, and I, at least my head, and I was able to move my neck, twist my neck. And the first thing that I did was I was concerned that maybe I was, and I don't know why, but I was concerned that maybe I was, that I had passed away, and that maybe my body was on the bed below me, and I twisted just enough to look down at my bed, and there was nothing there. So that was a relief. Then... I was able to look over to where my parents were in this sort of kitty corner bedroom uh, that was just off this doorway. And I was looking in at them, and there were a couple of beings holding their hands over them, like keeping them in some sort of stasis asleep. Oops. I mean, and they were, and my dad, I could see my dad was in a pool of sweat, and he seemed to be fighting like like an angry dream, kind of, mm. And but he was being held under and then I could finally see the beings that were holding them under. What they I look never, like. I never got to see the, the beings that were actually, I never really got to see the beings that were carrying me uh, and who were trying to solve this problem. Uh, but I looked over at the beings that were keeping my parents in the stasis, and they were small, gangly, sort of, but with those large black almond eyes that and one of them looked directly at me and i looked directly at him from this high position uh, and down at him and all i heard the only words i ever heard from them and the words were not out loud they were like in my head and the only words i heard were the one looking at me said he's awake and then i dropped like a rock I slammed back into my bed, uh, springs going crazy, and they were gone. What What's interesting here, and you've had a lot of time to analyze this for sure, what's interesting is they expected you to dematerialize, demolecularize, or whatever they were expecting. Uh, it didn't happen. Now, is it because you just you were the wrong DNA, right? You were the wrong type I, of human. I think so because the way I've the cases I've studied since then, it just appears that there's something about the people that they encounter, these alien visitors encounter, that either you're their flavor or you're not. And some people say it has to do with blood type. Other people say it has something to do with the DNA. I I don't know, but. Ever since that incident, there was never anything, anything. I never had any sort of contact, not even an observation ever since then, ever since that moment. So I was not the flavor that they wanted for some reason. To this day, I don't know why. Well, did, so, man, this is, I'll tell you why it kind of bums me out. So that means that probably you weren't recruited into the FBI because you had alien contact. You had a failed alien contact. <laughs> yeah. Right? Am I right? You know, yeah. and, and, yeah. and and not to be cavalier. How, how dare you describe me that way? Right, right, right. And not to be cavalier about this, but it's interesting how you were approached in law school, right? And in a normal situation w uh, with a contactee like yourself, I would kind of see through this a little bit and say that maybe the guy that approached you was told to approach you and you were placed into the FBI, you thought it was all cool and, and natural, but there was a grand plan here. But yeah. it was a failed abduction, right? Yeah. And you yeah. ha and I would have thought that if it had been the CIA or something. Or, like that. <laughs> good call, John. I like that. Um, the uh, uh, That was the only contact, though. Nothing nothing ever since. Not a word. Not Anything, not a word, not an observation, nothing. And what about your parents the next day? Oh, the next day. Oh, yeah, I write about that in my book, The Extra Dimensionals. I give the whole detail uh, because, well, one thing that struck me funny was these uh, the beings that were carrying me like a plank, like a helium filled plank, uh, they kept lowering me halfway down. And then they were examining the spot on the ceiling to see what was different about it. And they kept on then raising me back up again. And so I kept on being lowered and raised back up again and lower. It was just, they were like the dumbest engineers you could ever imagine. Anyway, uh, yes, the next morning, uh, my parents were, my family was a very religious family. Uh, so 
they all had shared a, a common dream about being kidnapped by these beings uh, and taken to a certain place. And so it was, uh, they had all shared. So in the morning, I woke up, which I swore, I swore I would never go to sleep that night, but I knocked right out. And when I woke up, there were adults shuffling all over the apartment, all over the area, and they were all putting together their plans to explain what happened in their home. And they completely said, oh, this was a demonic attack. It was, a, it was an attack by demons. And they were, for some reason, there's some kind of a guilty trinket. This was very big in, in that particular religion. Uh, whenever there was something demonic that would happen, it had to be some sort of a, a guilty trinket that someone had brought into the home. So they started tearing the apartment apart, looking for it. And to this day, I'm pretty convinced my dad went to the store and bought some kind of an Irish runes uh, charm Smart. and threw it under threw it under the linoleum to stop his apartment from being torn to pieces Smart. by all the... Yeah, yeah, yeah smart. Yeah. <laughs> It's very smart. Did you, uh, we've got uh, two minutes here, John. Um, did you tell your parents about what happened to you? Oh, absolutely. I told them wow. on, uh, on both occasions when I had my experiences. And uh, it was not very well received by my dad at all. And uh, my mom was different, though. My mom was uh, very much very understanding. And she told me, though, that uh, not the sort of thing you want to share with too many people, though. But I want to keep that under your hat uh, as much as possible. And, uh, you know, that's that's kind of how it went. I, I learned I learned very early that uh, certain things you don't talk about with people that uh, you don't know. For instance, that was that's basically how it went. Now, with this experience, did it cause you to constantly look at the sky? Did it change your outlook on life yes. in general? You know, the question has been answered if we're alone in the universe kind of thing. Um, yeah. Did it change you? And also, when you were going through your career at the FBI, did it affect the way that you dealt with cases and, and people? Well, it did in a sense that in the sense that I was, I'm always open to all possibilities. I'm always open to uh, non-material possibilities, and so that is just all that is is just an openness of mind right. that usually isn't there with material-based investigators, and that's that's all it is, and that's that's actually what what allowed me to see things see things when they did have a paranormal element involved with them that uh, often was not uh, that would not be accepted or spotted by other types of investigators and what and what's interesting what you're going to take a break right here what's interesting is you know the guy that I went and interviewed with um, now I'm wondering if he was an experiencer too. You never know, do you? This is Fade to Black. Our guest tonight is John DeSouza, FBI agent for over 20 years, and he's now an author and an ET investigator. More with John right after this break. Stay with us. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. Always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk, Jimmy Church with Fade to Black, KGRARadio.com. ¿Qué tal mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carcanel, tiburón, y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. Claro que sí. Hey there, quick question for you. Would you be okay with more energy, more endurance, thicker, healthier hair, a better mood? Reduced appearance of wrinkles, improved sleep, improved blood pressure and cholesterol profiles, improved vision, improved memory. Okay then. Well now, have you heard of Nature's Youth RSF? It's from the anti-aging experts at naturesyouth.com. Naturesyouth.com. See, at Nature's Youth, they understand exactly what it means to provide top quality health products. And Nature's Youth customers not only improve their health, they know they're also providing their body with the right nourishment to maintain that peak performance and fight the aging process. If health, wellness, and nutrition are what you desire, choose Nature's Youth RSF. I did. You see, you're going to get older. It's just up to you how you feel when you get there. Get started today. Nature's Youth RSF. Simple to use, simple to order. Go to naturesyouth.com. That's naturesyouth.com. Naturesyouth.com. 
I was introduced to this remarkable product, Balance of Nature Fruits and Veggies, and to say it's amazing is an understatement. Balance of Nature provides the nutrients of 9 to 11 servings of 31 different whole ripened fruits and veggies per day, and the cost to the consumer for 9 to 11 servings is about 22 cents per serving, as opposed to over a dollar in the store. Balance of Nature Fruits and Veggies helps boost the immune system by over 720%, and they also provide a health coach for you at no charge to guide you with any questions you may have. And you can also visit their website for testimonials on balanceofnature.com. So take steps to give yourself better overall health and call them now, toll free, at 800-246-8751. That's 800-246-8751 or go to balanceofnature.com right now. Make sure to let them know you heard it here by using promo code TALK for a special discount. That's balanceofnature.com and use promo code TALK. You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This portion of the show is brought to you by Life Change Tea. Just go right now by clicking on the banners over at jimmychurchradio.com to get the tea.com. Just mention Jimmy when you order, either online or over the phone, and you're going to get free shipping. Also, I want to remind everybody that this month we're going to be giving away a Tascam DM100 Mark III digital recorder. $300, man. $300 retail value. It's going to go to one lucky fan or not. Go to the membership area. Subscribe for one year. And in like two weeks, two weeks, we're going to draw a name live on the air, live, out of a hat, old school, on camera. And somebody is going to win this digital recorder. Just go to the membership area. All right, John, I've got to, I've got a million questions here in Twitter, by the way. I'm sure you're seeing this stuff pile up. But before we get to that, I want to, I want to go uh, back to a couple of the other files that you um, uncovered when you were at the FBI. But the men in black, what have you discovered about that phenomenon? Are they employed by the FBI? Are they a part of another division of the government? Um, have you had any contact with the men in black? I personally have not had any contact with the men in black. But then again, like I said, my experiences stopped after the age of nine. So I wouldn't have had reason for them to come knocking on my door. But I have studied several cases of contact with the men in black and people who come across them. And, you know, some of them, some of the cases can be attributed. I've seen some of them that can be attributed to just national security agencies where for some reason they've just been directed to talk with contactees and to maybe wash out the, the truth of what they're saying. Uh, but the real Men in Black experiences, the ones that appear supernatural to me, uh, those cases, I believe, are from global shops. I believe they are from the global power structure, not from any national governments, because these, they, I believe they, they're being employed sort of as next, gen, next level technology, and they are themselves next level technology. And I don't believe... The real ones, the real men in black are associated with any national government. That's just how I see it. They're not under government control. 
They're not, under ET control is what you're suggesting. Yeah, well, I call I call them the global controllers. I call them uh, – they're global government, except they're not government at all. They're just a system of control. I call them EPIC, the elite powers in control. Mm -hmm. I don't like to use the I word that people like to – because I know those web crawlers are out there searching for people who use certain terms like you were talking about right, earlier, right. earlier today. And so, yeah, that's what I, I see the global power structure, the – the epic, as I like to call them, I see them producing these shops that have the men in black uh, crawling around um, and knocking on people's doors. But uh, don't don't open those doors. That's what I always tell people. Don't. And if you do, always ask people for their badge number. Whatever agency they claim to be from, always ask for a badge number. Then you can take that little number, you can call their agency and verify that they really are who they say they are. With um, different conferences around the country, like DEF CON or HOPE, uh, you know, the hacker conferences, those are uh, attended by the FBI, uh, the Air Force, the NSA. They go, they're recruiting, they're trying to share information, and they want to know what hackers are doing, and, and they are very... Uh, um, uh, vocal about their presence there. They're not trying to hide their presence. In fact, they even play games at those conferences, spot the Fed, right? Wow. <laughs> right? Now, uh, what about the UFO conferences? Does the government have an interest there? Do, would there be, uh, you know, uh, an agent that is there to listen or to to make contact with other contactees? No, there wouldn't be. I'm, I'm fairly certain of that. Unless, unless there's an international terrorist who happens to be there for whatever reason. That's the only, that's the only uh, way I would ever see any sort of uh, presence from say, any of these domestic agencies being there. Now, just one, no one would suggest, you know, listening to that answer, which I'm with you, I am, but th that that would purely be disinformation. That you would have to say that, right? Yeah, that's right. I would. I didn't and, think of that. And, well, okay. All right. So th that, that's my disclaimer there. <laughs> it's <Okay. laughs> very interesting. Okay. Let's go back to uh, uh, we did the Indigo Children file. Um, what was, if you can remember, like in a chronological order, what was the next file that you uh, uncovered uh, while you were with the agency that had a paranormal uh, bend to it? Okay, well, it's a couple of years later. Uh, there was there was an incident in 2004 that is known as the Olympic Park bombing, and I'm just and this is from my book, The Para Investigators: uh, True Tales and Concepts of Supernaturally Gifted Investigators. And so, there was an individual, a security guard. Uh, named Richard Jewell, mm -hmm. and he was a paunchy guy with a southern drawl, not somebody you ever thought was going to accomplish anything big in life. However, there was one night in uh, one night in the Olympic Village uh, on January twenty, uh, July twenty seventh, in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, when he became the greatest investigator who ever lived. Right, and the reason was because he spotted one of these giant, oversized hiking packs. Uh, these these big things that are like four feet tall, uh, that you know weigh like weigh like a hundred pounds on your back for extended hiking, and he spotted it in the middle of a walking path, and it was on its own. Now any security guard would have just hauled the thing in to lost and found or to a supervisor, and just uh, you know try to find out what happened that day, uh, what happened, what's going on with this thing. But on this day, this guy became like. Like I said, the greatest investigator who ever lived. And he decided that this package was a suspicious package. And he followed protocols that are really amazing protocols. He set up police tape around this thing. And we're talking about a very, very busy night uh, in, uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, right after the Olympic Games had let out. It was about 1 in the morning. It was late at night. But still, it was like a party atmosphere. And there were hundreds, if not thousands of people streaming down these walking paths and people, all kinds of civilians, you know, children, families, all kinds of people. There were even, there were media people get interviewing athletes uh, in the middle of this Olympic village. And 
there was so there were cords of people everywhere and it was really really crowded well he set up a police tape around this suspicious package uh he did it very meticulously he did it very carefully and then he started telling people to move out of the area in a very gentle voice he started telling people get away from this package get away from this package uh, he advised his uh, his chain of command what was going on, and he told people get because people were ignoring his commands. They kept on walking in this walkway too close to this package, and so he started getting louder. And he started using his body, and he told people, and he started using his body to push up against people, and he started yelling at them to get out of the perimeter, not just the inner perimeter, but the outer perimeter as well, to get far away. He was waving his hands. He was screaming. And now his screaming started to raise to a high pitch. And he was screaming at the top of his lungs at people, move out of the way. People finally started listening to him and they started moving and not walking in this perimeter area. They finally started getting far away from it. All these hundreds and hundreds of people that are walking, they saw him gesticulating, using his arms, using his whole body to scream, and his pitch just got higher and higher. Now, somehow, it appeared to investigators who were watching the videotapes of this happening. Uh, they were on the ground, they were examining these videotapes of him, and it became apparent to them, one thing became apparent above all, uh, and it's the same thing that became apparent to me. It was just this. He knew it was a bomb. And he did. Now, shortly after he got to his highest pitch of screaming and getting people out of the area, the bomb went off. Mm -hmm. uh, and about two people, about two, I'd say roughly about two people were injured or killed instead of 200 people which is exactly what would have happened right. if he hadn't done everything that he did right now he was hailed as a hero at first but like i said after investigators were reviewing these tapes over and over again like i did as well they came to that they couldn't get away from that conclusion and that conclusion was he knew it was a bomb and anyone who looks at these tapes long enough i think you'd come to the same conclusion i know i did the difference is I came to the conclusion that he knew it was a bomb because he either he remote viewed inside that package, right. he had a vision, he had some kind of paranormal ability because he was on tape the whole I mean he's on camera the whole time. He never looked inside of right. that thing. And everyone knows. It. And yet, if you listen to his voice, you listen to the desperation, the panic in his voice, you can tell that he knew it was a bomb. Now, investigators in the field concluded the only way he could have known it was a bomb was because he planted the bomb. Right, he had something to, to do with it. Right, right, right. And that's the narrative that they went with, and that's the narrative that was splashed all over the place. And his life was basically ruined for 88 days while he was seen by the media, by everybody, as being the Olympic Park bomber. And instead of being the great hero, which is what he was. And so, like I said, I, I knew when I listened to those tapes, I knew that he was aware it was a bomb, but because of, because of who I am, because of what I, the things that, uh, the openness that I have, I was able to come to the conclusion, which I believe is the right conclusion that he knew because he looked inside that thing supernaturally, somehow supernaturally, he knew it, that's how the knowledge came to him. And that case was the that for 88 days, his, his life was basically ruined. And that case was the, the only one I've ever seen where the uh, U.S. attorney uh, basically came out and had to give a public statement that he was not the bomber, that he was wrongly accused, and that they were, they were sorry that they ever did accuse him. And of course, as people know shortly after that, um, uh, Eric Rudolph, the uh, real bomber, was exposed and actually confessed. Uh, he was probably he was kind of perturbed that somebody else took credit for his hard work. Right. And yeah, so he actually came out and and confessed that he was. But it was too late for Richard Jewell. Richard Jewell and I call this story the death by a broken heart because basically his he had looked up to law enforcement and the FBI. Uh, they, he had them in such a position of hero worship that 
his heart was broken. His heart was broken, and he died shortly after that. And the coroner's report can say that he died from diabetes or whatever they put on there, but to me, it really looked like he died from a broken heart. Well, he got a pretty good paycheck. I hope he went out in style, if you know what yes. I mean. But yes, I did. Did he ever, did Richard Jewell ever say that he had a vision? I I doubt that he would ever say anything like that, right. considering considering the media, the persecution that he suffered, uh, that he suffered at the hands of of all the mainstream media, basically. Yeah, I remember. I, mean, I remember. Uh, I feel like I just cut you off. I apologize, but I remember no, no. him saying, "I just, I knew that it was a bomb, right?" And and yes. you're absolutely right about that. You know, how could, from the bureau standpoint, the only way that he could have known is it is because he had something to do with it. And it, as it turns out, it was Eric Robert Rudolph. Right. And right. and he had exactly. absolutely nothing to do with it at all. Now, call it intuition, call it a vision, call it X-ray vision, you know, yeah. call it what you want. But but something happened. And yeah. I, I, I'm just wondering if you ever, uh, you know, if you ever, uh, you know, stressed what it was that made him uh, go crazy. I, you know, I saw that. I saw the video. I, I saw it live. I was watching yeah. and I was like, wow, that. It didn't look like that big of an explosion on TV, right? And I saw it, and it, did, it wasn't that loud. It turned out right. to be crazy big and everything else. It's weird when you see a real bomb explode. It's not It's not right. an action movie explosion. Which, you know, like the Boston right. bombing right. at the marathon. Yeah. Uh, you know, that was, that was horrific, but it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't that big. Right, but it doesn't have to be big because the way it's set up, it's set up with those nails as bullets, right? So, so that it can be whatever size explosion it is. But then those nails get driven out like bullets to shred anything that's in the area. That's, that's incredible. That's, I, yeah, I that's you know, I would have never thought about Richard Jewell. That's uh, that's a pretty interesting case, and the FBI just wanted nothing to do with it. To close the file. Yeah, that's uh, that's basically well. Once they had Eric Robert Rudolph as the real bomber, then uh, everything was good. No, so, I mean it, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I'm referring to you take Richard Jewell and you take him to the CIA and you put him in the remote viewing program. Right? <laughs> that's oh, yeah. what you. That's how the file closes out. But that's not right. they. They don't want to look at that angle. And that's why I, that's why I wrote my book, The Para Investigators, to give all these stories about these investigators who risked their lives, sometimes lost their lives, using gifts to help society to save people's lives, and you know how it was not really not that it wasn't appreciated, but that it couldn't be accepted in the manner in which it was provided. No one could say, "Oh, you used some gifts. You used some uh, immaterial gifts." to uh, help us. Thank you so much. You know, let's encourage those gifts. Let's, uh, let's go have you examined, like you said, you know, at the, at the CIA shop to see what other powers you have, you know? No, but that's not, that's not how things work, unfortunately. Now you have, uh, you have a couple of interesting uh, views and, and theories about ET and ET visitation and the original UFO hypothesis about the nuts and bolts uh, craft, you know, arriving here from somewhere else and and the propulsion systems and, and that view that is, and well, it still is around today, but uh, I, I think scientifically we're starting to look at things a little bit differently. You have been suggesting this for quite a while now. Um, so take me through, take the audience through uh, your your i don't want to quite call it a theory but through your investigations what we are experiencing when we see something in the sky or get a visit oh yeah absolutely uh i wrote my book the extra dimensionals as the as the coming back of a bad penny extra dimensionality is a bad penny it's basically a hypothesis that uh, puts together several ideas that have been out there for a long time. And one of them is that, uh, is that there's nobody in there that, uh, these UFOs that we see, well, not, uh, not all of them because most UFO sightings are probably unprovable. They're not a sufficient, not sufficient, uh, 
information on them to to say whether they're actually supernatural. But there's always that small percentage of UFO sightings and alien visitor experiences that are genuine. Every year, there's that small percentage that are real and that are possibly uh, unexplainable and possibly supernatural. And extra-dimensionality, uh, one of the hypotheses that I have is that there's nobody in there. These UFOs are empty. There, are, there is no one inside of them. Another one is that uh, they are alive. Uh, they are, the UFOs themselves are alive, that they actually accompany alien visitors, not as canisters that they crowd themselves into to sail across the galaxies, but that they're more like familiars, like uh, the sort of like uh, assistants that, that accompany these alien visitors and carry out tasks for them and help them with these tasks. Uh, a lot of these ideas, if people want to see what I'm talking about, is in this document that I, that I call the smoking gun. It's uh, on the at FBI vault at the vault.fbi.gov on uh, under unexplained phenomena. Anybody can go and check it. Uh, it's under unexplained phenomena. You click on that, and then you go to the UFO documents, and you click on the first group. Of UFO documents, and then you go to page 22 of the first group, uh, which is 1947, uh, dated July, and that is a memorandum of importance, and it is one of the only, it is the single most downloaded document in the history of government archives. It has a few million downloads, and this document is from an FBI supervisor where he wrote to the scientific community because he said he had a source. He had a, a source that was giving him information. Now, you can't ever reveal the name of a source, but he revealed what type of source it was. He says the source was supernormal, uh, which is an old-timey word for supernatural. So I believe his source was himself an alien visitor because his conclusions line up with everything that I just said. He says, and he states in there about eight or nine conclusions. And he says, basically, there's nobody inside these UFOs. And he describes it as remote control. Uh, then he says, they are alive. He says that uh, these, these alien visitors are here to establish whether they can coexist, they can exist permanently in our vibration. He also says, they're not coming here from other galaxies or other planets. He says they are coming from other locas, as he says it, or talas, which is old Vedic terms for they're coming here from other dimensions. They are not in our reality. He says they, he said they change their, their vibratory rate to match our physical vibratory rate, and then they can be here for temporary periods of time. And he says, once they're finished, whatever limited task they have, he says they change their vibration back and they go back to their own to their own uh, uh, existence, their own dimension of time. So he says it's he says it's very clear that they are not cramming themselves into little because that's a human analysis. That's a human way of looking at things. They're not cramming themselves into metal shells and sailing across the galaxies to get here physically. That's, he says that's not what happens. He says they are not out there. He says they are actually here on Earth, and they're coming and going from Earth all the time, but not physically. He says they materialize here, and then he says they dematerialize back to someplace else. And yeah, then he rem- says... Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, I thought you were pausing. Uh, there was another <laughs> uh, statement. I've, I've read that document so many times, right? Uh, there's a, a part where he goes, you know, it, 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 I'm going to paraphrase, dude, if you shoot, you know, we have, we will have major problems. And that was a yeah. really interesting, uh, take for such a dated yeah. document also. And you've referenced this for such an old document back then, some of the viewpoints that were there weren't part of any UFO or flying saucer culture back then. It was uh, 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 coming from. It was coming from somewhere. The information was coming from somewhere that seemed to be direct and also very scientific 
um, yeah. that that wasn't part of the verbiage that people were using back then. It wasn't part of their mindset. <laughs> exactly. And as a matter of fact, in that document at the top, uh, he says, I am sending this out to the scientific community. Right. He says, I know that the scientific community is probably not going to listen to me because of the source that I am using to get this information. He's referring to his uh, supernatural buddy right. who is giving him that information. But he says, it doesn't matter. I still have to put out this information because I have to try to help them. That's basically what he says. And it is amazing. It is amazing what is in that document and how it juxtaposes to what we're seeing today. And the other thing he says is that is that these ships are not these these things are these UFOs are not made out of metal like we think. He says they're basically made out of plasma. They are made out of a plasma type of energy, which is why we see them materializing and dematerializing, uh, involving light, a lot, great deals of well, what we perceive as light. Well, now, when we take this as a whole and through your investigations, are they getting here from our solar system? Are they part of our solar system? Are they part of the galaxy, the Milky Way? Or are they coming from another galaxy altogether, somewhere else in the universe? No, I believe that they are coming, and I build a case for this in, in my book, uh, The Extra Dimensionals. I believe they're coming from an entirely different dimension of reality, not anything to do with our solar system, our galaxy, the Milky Way, uh, or anything in our reality. As a matter of fact, there's, I believe that there's nothing out there. They are not out there. If you send these metal tubes into outer space, these rockets uh, with astronauts in them, I don't think there's anybody out there. However, Earth itself is primarily a gateway and secondarily a planet. I believe they're, we're, they're transiting constantly in and out from Earth itself. And that's why they are. They are here all the time. And But they're using the Earth as a gateway. And that's... now. But also, I would have to add, it's obvious if you look around our solar system, you see the structures on the moon, see the structures on Mars. There appears there was a time when the alien visitors had this problem solved, and they could be here more or less physically uh, on a permanent basis. Because if you look around, you look around uh, the, all these structures on Mars, on these structures on the moon, and elsewhere, also in the, in the solar system, they were, there was a time when they had this problem solved, but for some reason, something changed, something changed because they can't do it now. They can't do this permanent presence thing now. That's why the phenomena is like Jack Vallée said, it's more spiritistic in nature than physical. It's like, uh, it's sort of like a ghost, you know, like here they are, now they're gone. You know, uh, they're not they're not just doing this parade on the White House lawn like they should be if they really could be physical in a permanent in any sort of a permanent way. OK, we're going to we've got to t go uh, way deeper into this. Uh, I find it fascinating. Our guest tonight, John D'Souza. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and KGRA The Planet. More with John right after this break. You stay right there. Everybody, this is Rob Halford, the Metal Guard, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. KGRA Radio, Intelligent Talk. Do you know what's in your body soap? Well, I didn't know the answer until about five years ago when I looked at the label of my soap and was shocked to see all the chemicals. For my entire life, I had been assaulting the largest organ of my body, my skin, and to think my children were using it too. Well, a lot has changed since then. Today, my family and I operate Stone City Farms, where we make and sell all natural goat milk soap using fresh goat milk from goats we raise on our farm. Our mission at Stone City Farm is to produce high quality, all natural goat milk soap for people who want a fresh, unrefined natural product. At Stone City Farms, we offer scented and unscented soaps and a signature line of gift sets customizable to your needs. To see what our customers are saying, go to 
StoneCityFarm.com. Use the code NATURAL for a 20% discount. That's StoneCityFarm.com, code NATURAL for 20% off your order. You never know what could be hiding in your soap. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Would you like relief from muscle pain, headaches, and discomfort to sleep better, have more energy during the day, and just feel naturally amazing? Fibromalic can help. Its blend of malic acid and magnesium can provide pain relief and comfort for those who experience fibromyalgia. It helps your body absorb more oxygen, and it works quickly for a significant reduction in pain within 48 hours, all without a prescription. Ask for Fibromalic at health and vitamin shops or shop Fibromalic.com. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of Fade to Black by just calling 605-562-4482. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Just call 605-562-4482. You can listen to me, Jimmy Church, on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Go back, Lee Tappy. secret i love ponies i really love ponies i'm serious i couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush why fade to black because you never got that pony damn it this is fade to black with jimmy church on the game changer radio network and kgra the global radio alliance Welcome back, Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. You can follow me on Twitter at J Church Radio. Very simple. Email is Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. We're on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, the planet. Our guest tonight, John D'Souza, the X-Man, 20 years in the FBI. Now, John, you've stirred a fire here. I'm watching a Twitter. I, I expected this. But, uh, what? Okay. Uh, let's continue this conversation. I want everybody to know I'm not going to open up the phone lines. If you have any questions, keep them going in Twitter. Uh, Rita will then forward them into me and I'll see them here, but I don't want to interrupt the flow of this conversation. Um, I like where it's going. Okay. We have, we have a, we have a problem here. Okay. The problem is this, the inner, the universe is not empty. I understand what you just said, so we're going to continue that. But on the flip side, you were nine years old, right? You You were levitated. You had your forehead banged on the ceiling. There were beings in the room. You saw the flying saucer or the craft yourself. And that is that almost contradicts what you're trying to say here. So how would you suggest that the universe is empty? Also... <laughs> Give me your best shot at this. If if the beings are interdimensional, which is cool, I I'm I'm with you on that side. And if they're using the Earth for a gateway, then they are gatewaying to somewhere else, like they are gatewaying back to here. So I I need you to try to clarify this because it seems a little uh, paradoxical. It seems a little uh, uh, it it's colliding with itself. Yes, uh, the universe definitely is not empty, uh, but the problem is they are coming from the earth. So they can be out there, let's say. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, I had my own experiences. They are here. They are here. They are uh, on the earth. They are transiting in and out all the time. And alien visitors, of course, I'm talking about. And so, yeah, they can be They can be out there. They can be out there. They can be uh anywhere uh, in our solar system 
but they are coming through the earth as a gateway is what i'm saying and so they can maintain presence but i don't believe they can maintain permanent presence that's that's the only rub in this ointment that i see i don't believe they can exist here uh, the way that they used to in the past, from what we see in the in the all the structures and the what looks like all kinds of uh, intelligently built structures uh, all over all over our solar system, really, uh, in other in other places. So that's that's how I see it. I see that uh, they can be out there, but they're coming from here and they go back through here as well, and they are disappearing to other other dimensions, other levels of existence that don't have anything, don't have coincide with ours at all. There are an infinite, well, it's not quite infinite, but by a numbers crunch, we I'll just go with an infinite number there. You know, when we are dealing with, uh, you know, 500 billion or a trillion galaxies that have been expanding universes, uh, multiverses, um, that has been expanding for 18 billion years. And we look at the Hubble images of when you think of our Milky Way, which has 500 billion stars and uh, the numbers are absolutely mind boggling. So to suggest that we would be the only ones and nobody would know that we are here that's the opposite of the way that we look at the universe. We are looking for exoplanets. We are looking for life. Yes. Wouldn't that intelligent life be just like us and looking for us too? Yes, and that's Fermi's paradox, which I talk about at length. Uh, Fermi's paradox basically says that if you look at the age of our universe, you look at the amount of stars, you look at the amount of, of planets that are the level one planets, the ones that could sustain life that are likely, I and mean, this is all according to probabilities, but they're very high probabilities. The probabilities of these uh, Goldilocks planets, uh, these systems, and the age of these planets uh, that we can see and those systems that we can see, the chances are that overwhelming, overwhelming probability that we would have constant physical parades of alien visitors having trade with us and having physical presence on our Earth already because of the age of the universe and what we're, what we're seeing and what would have happened and how many of these, these civilizations would have become interstellar by now. They would have reached us at this time if they were coming from outer space. So Fermi's paradox is that it's not happening. Yep. But, but, Why is it not? But Fermi was wrong. See, that's the thing. And now, I, Fermi's paradox, if you lay it out like that, okay, that's one side of the argument. I, I totally get it and I totally understand it. But that doesn't make him right. And that's the, I, I, I'm Fermi was was wrong for a lot of different reasons. And, I, and I'll tell you why. The one of the things with uh, Fermi's paradox and please let's enjoy this conversation here because I want you to come back with your best. Right. Yes. <laughs> Is this um, we are talking about giant expanses of time. That's what Fermi did not uh, did factor it in at all, because here us right now between 1900 and the year 2007, that's 117 years where we have the ability uh, with radio telescopes and to observe electronically the universe, certainly visit the moon and get satellites out there and Hubble. Right. That's a very narrow window of time. When you are visiting from something that is four light years away or 40 light years away or 400 light years away, the chances of you doing that drive by here on Earth through this period of time right now in this window, think about that. Yes. That's where Fermi is completely out of whack. Now, how you would visit Earth is the way that we visit the solar system is we're sending out satellites, we're sending out probes, we're sending out rovers. And that stuff coming by here, 
um, and it, when, when we're dealing with interstellar travel, how you would do it, and this is this is me, John, but this is how my brain works. How would you do it if you were 10,000 years more advanced than us today? How would we do it in 10,000 years from now? Is we would build self-replicating probes. They would go out, visit a planet, grab the resources, a robot, build another probe, launch it back out, and continue and replicate and spread out across the universe and report back with the news that you've got. We don't have humans on those, right? They're just out. Same thing here. That's, that's exactly what has been going on for probably three billion years. I can't, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's where Fermi is is wrong. I totally agree with that. And I'm going to say yeah. one more thing. It's the same thing with time travel and what Stephen Hawking said about that. There is time travel is impossible because nobody from the future is visiting us now. Well, <laughs> what uh, what he what where where Hawking is wrong. All right. And I'll say this, man, I'm not a genius. I'm not a Ph.D., but where Hawking is wrong is if I'm time traveling, if John D'Souza is time traveling, the last thing you are going to do is go back in time and say, hey, I'm a time traveler. You wouldn't do that. You would be shot and killed. Right. You would right. also probably mess up the timeline. Right. Mm -hmm. So you would run invisible. You would run in the background. You would come in, do your thing, and then go back. No time traveler is going to show up here and say, I'm a time traveler. It just wouldn't happen. It just wouldn't. And that's where Hawking is wrong. And right. you, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not the smartest guy in the world. I'm just not. But you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't show up at the crucifixion and go, dude, uh, Roman gladiator guy. I'm from 2017. I just want to see how you guys dealt with Christ. You wouldn't right. do that. You wouldn't you right. wouldn't run visible. Right. right. Am I making sense? Yes, you are. Oh. But here's my best uh, retort to. Uh, Fermi being wrong, which is that there's a that's that constitutes like a humanizing of the problem. Again, you're you're assuming that alien visitors would not have solved uh, time and distance, that they would not have a way around time and distance, and I believe that they I believe that they do. They I do. believe they. They yes. have uh, conquered, and they have, and it's not a big deal if you're ten thousand years ahead of our technology. I believe that they are; they have no problem surpassing time and physical distance. So they wouldn't. So I believe they wouldn't travel the way that we would. Uh, I think you mentioned replicants or creating uh, rockets that might take you know a thousand light years to get from one place to another. And you'd have to solve that problem in a human way. But I don't think they have that problem in a human way. I don't think time and distance are restrictions for them, exactly because of what I'm saying. That yeah, I change. agree with you. That yeah. I 100% I agree with you there. Yeah. What I am referring to is if you are going to go and explore the vastness of the universe, the pure vastness of it, the resources, the ships that you would be sending out would be human. You wouldn't do that. You would build the ships as you go. You would oh. build the little probes oh, yeah. as you go. I mean that, and you would forget about it. You know, you just send them on their mission, and if they find something, you'll find out about it later. But whatever, I'm moving on. And uh, you know, with with the, what they're dealing with on that planet, <laughs> but but the other side of it, you know, wormholes or or. Uh, uh, figuring out faster than speed of light travel, uh, you know, folding space and bending space and dealing with space time. Absolutely. Yeah. All of that. We're close right now to figuring that out on our own. And we barely have electric cars. Right. Exactly. And, and so we're understanding that. I get you. OK, so back to your point, though, which I find very interesting is the interdimensional side of it and that they are here. And I totally get that. So with your experience that you had when you were nine or the, the things that I have seen as an adult, so uh, are you suggesting that we only see them for an instant, right? They come into phase, right? That, yes. Yeah. Not Maybe not an instant, but for a temporary, very temporary period. Uh, but 
the uh, the the what I was telling you about time not being a bar to alien visitors, not being not being an obstacle at all. I we're seeing we're seeing little clues about that as you study abduction cases, as you study uh, cattle mutilation cases. Here's one of the strange here's one of the strange things in uh, in uh, abduction cases, and whether you're going whether you're looking at Betty and Barney Hill or or any of the many other cases since that, one of the strange things that seems to happen uh, all the time in these abduction cases is that you have the target that is targeted, the subject that's targeted by some sort of plasma vehicle that follows them, then catches up to them, then they are captured. There's a command and control situation. They take those people into their custody. Uh, and for some reason, there's always a, uh, there's always a stoppage of all electronics, all electronics and all uh, clocks, clocks, watches, anything to do with time. And one of the one of the strange things, and this this is something I, I saw first uh, with the the great Jim Mars, the uh, writer who wrote uh, Alien Agenda. He said he said everybody assumes that this is electromagnetic interference that stops all the devices. He says, he says, what if it's not? What if it's actually time itself that is being stopped or paused, so to speak? And then I thought about that as I looked at more and more cases. And, you know, it's true. It really looks like there's possibly time manipulation that's involved in these cases. Because then if you look at some of these cattle mutilation cases, uh, many of which, many of which are happening in these in these states like montana and idaho and happening to these ranchers who set up these extraordinary defense mechanisms, security uh, systems and they uh, set up video cameras they set up all kinds of things to stop these cattle mutilations and instead of being able to stop all they all they capture is a flash of light and then the cattle mutilation is done it's as if time is just stopped or paused paused they do their business on these on these poor animals and then they get out of there and then time is restarted so i'm seeing more and more of these cases that seem to leave cruel leave clues breadcrumbs behind of time manipulation that seems very easy for these alien visitors so that's why when you talk about these when we talk about these theories i just don't see i don't see time and distance as being any sort of bar to anything alien visitors want to do because of their abilities that's interesting very interesting um and on that same take why if 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 you are interdimensional and from here if you're an earthling you're just from another dimension why why abduct us or why do the cattle mutilation part or any animal mutilation or abduction if you're from here anyway wouldn't you understand this planet i mean why why that why abduct why probe mm, that is the central question isn't that it is a great question and i have an answer by saying something really radical to begin with which is that alien abductions are a fraud they are a fraud and i'll tell you why Alien abductions tend to have, and it's the same reason, it has very much in common with animal mutilations. Uh, and the reason is because alien abductions tend to have all these steps to them. Like I said before, there's the targeting by this, usually it's some sort of plasma vehicle, targets the subject, then they go and get the subject, then they uh, exercise command and control of the subject. There's some limited communication with the subject, you know, stay calm, there's telepathic communication. Then there's uh, ushering them to this medical sort of medical facility then there is the medical procedures that they go through semi-medical that they go through and then the final step is always uh, the same as it is with animal mutilations which is the extracting of the human material samples uh, sperm blood ova uh, all kinds of samples from the body now the reason why i say this is a fraud is because if you look at the technology that they have and the abilities that they have also including time manipulation these other all these steps 
are completely unnecessary and superfluous, except for the last, which I believe is the goal, the real goal, the collection of human material, collection of human samples, sperm, blood, ova, uh, all these things that they get from the humans. That's the real goal of these alien uh, human abductions. So the fraud is the deflection. Yes, it's distraction, it's theater, it's completely unnecessary and why are they doing it yeah it makes sense uh, i've often wondered that myself i mean it doesn't it doesn't make any sense so you're not yeah. saying i want to be clear here to everybody before they all freak out and lose <laughs> yeah. their minds you're not saying fraud on the uh the experiencers part that's not no, fraud that no, the no. experience is real and does happen you're saying it is deflection on the alien part yes they want us yes. to come back and say they took my fingernails they, yes. they took my belly button yes. lint, right? And they it's scraped a, under my toenails. Yes. yes. It's a theater being built up. They were building up this narrative. So someday they can point back and say, oh, look at all this. We did all this for a reason. We're, we're building this narrative that's very important to us. And what that's going to end up in, I don't know exactly. But what I do know is that with their state of technology, they could very easily appear especially with time manipulation that i believe they have the ability to do they could appear at any place that has lots of humans in it collect all the samples that they want as many as they want and disappear again and nobody would even would hardly know they're there except for a few aches and pains here and there right and they could do that oh they, well, they probably need... do do that mm. if you think i mean they could freeze time and go and you know, go to a Van Halen concert and go and collect DNA from 18,000 right. exactly. people exactly. and nobody would know they were they there. Will. I don't, I, because this narrative is very important to them for some reason, right. this theater that they want to put on. And it's, it's a ridiculous theater because we, we can tell their state of technology is so advanced that they don't need to go through these other steps. They have no need. And it's the same thing with the cattle mutilations. The real goal, they're not really mutilations. They're collection, they're harvestings. Then human abductions, human alien abductions are also the same. They're harvestings of this material. And all of this material is being collected. And I believe someday it's going to come back to us in a big, big way. Now, you have an interesting take on, on Travis Walton, too, as well. And, he, you know, he's a really good friend of mine and, 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 and a friend of this show. And I've hung out with him and had dinner and, and breakfast and lunch and all kinds of things. I think he's a, a great guy. But yes. uh, if we apply all of this the way that you are stating it here, then why Travis and why have it go down like that? Ah, you know, the Travis Walton case is a fascinating case because it doesn't fit into the pattern of every other right. human alien abduction has ever happened. Right. It has been completely unique. And Travis has come to the same conclusion that I have, uh, which is that the reason, and I, I, I want to mention just for people who may not know that uh, Travis Walton was a logger in uh, Sitgraves, uh, Arizona uh, National Park. He was with another logging crew. He was a very young man. He was barely like 20 years old when it happened in 1975. And he, his uh, crew was finished for the day. They were going home and they piled into a truck and this giant plasma vehicle just appeared just above the tree line in a clearing, in a clearing. And foolishly, he ran underneath the halo of light, ran underneath his vehicle. He was struck down pretty much dead. And and his, uh, his friends peeled out. They were very scared. They took off. And now, I, I, don't know if, uh, I don't know if you know about this, but there was another witness that is not part of the known witnesses. That night in the forest, there was a gentleman who was in the forest hunting for something uh, with his wife. And he was in the military at the time. And he was hunting. I don't know what you hunt at night, but he was hunting for something at night. And he emerged from the forest. He looked to his right, and he saw a truck uh, peeling out with all Travis's friends and just taking off like a bat out of hell. He looked to his left, and he saw a young, skinny man, uh, looked like he was dead weight, and being lifted up uh, from the forest floor, being lifted up above the tree line. And if you go to my book, The Extra Dimensionals, I portray portrayed exactly that scene that he says he saw 
Now, the reason I repeated that he that he saw it is because he took polygraphs that he did see what he said he saw, and he saw Travis Walton being lifted up underneath a ship and into the ship itself. And I actually was so captured by that when I heard that uh, I put it on the cover of my book, The Extra Dimensionals, and. He, of course, he was never accepted as a witness by Travis Walton because later on uh, it was shown, even though he took polygraphs that showed the truth uh, that he was really was there and he did see what he said he saw. Uh, the problem, of course, was that he showed you know, later on it was shown that he had contacts with these professional debunker groups mm -hmm. that had plagued Travis and his and his people for so long mm -hmm. uh, and had caused them all kinds of problems for several for many years and so because of that Travis never accepted this particular this witness and this uh, and this witness was never was never really taken into the circle of people who are backing up uh, Travis, but like I said, his testimony is still important because he did show that it was truthful. He was being truthful in what he saw. So, yeah, Travis's case, uh, and like I said, Travis came to the same conclusion. It appears that he was struck down by this ship that took off. It gave off, and it appears that he was struck down by accident, that the ship gave off some kind of a bolt of energy that struck him down and probably struck him down dead, and that this was absolutely not an alien human abduction case at all. What it was was a rescue operation, right. and they probably took up his dead body, brought it onto somewhere, and they revived him. They basically brought him back to life. And I believe it's because it was outside of their programming to to cause any harm to a human. And that answers why when they w revived him and they woke him up and he was very aggressive towards these three greys that were trying to deal with him, why they were so unprepared to deal with an aggressive human. And they just had no answer whatsoever. And it's because it was not an abduction. They, they were not intending to abduct him. All they wanted was to revive him, bring him back to life, and deliver him back to that forest where he came from. That was all they wanted. The If we stay with this interdimensional from Earth uh, hypothesis, which, again, I, I, I firmly feel, John, and I know that you know this, everything needs to be pushed to the center of the table and discussed, right? That, that that's Absolutely. It. Everything needs to be discussed. Uh, so this scenario with Travis, were they from here then too as well? And they weren't from elsewhere in the universe? They were from elsewhere in the universe, but uh, they came here and they had their mission to perform whatever it was. Okay. And they got involved with something that was outside of their mission, unfortunately. Now, see, yeah. now you just went against the Fermi paradox yourself, so I win. You owe okay. me dinner. You owe me dinner. <laughs> Let's take. I, well, I, normally, I would say. Uh, I'll uh, <laughs> normally, I would say right here, uh, great show. I'm not. I'm going to talk you into some overtime. So you're going to stay right there. We're not great. done quite yet. It is John D'Souza. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Great conversation tonight. Everybody just stay right there. He spent 20 years in the FBI. He's now an ET investigator and author. We're going to finish this up right after this short break. Stay with us. Listen to my boy, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. Balance of Nature's Fruits and Veggies. I had gout in both my knees, and it's gone. Uh, well, I'm pretty stupid. I should have ordered it, like, you know, 15 years ago. Best really? thing I ever got in my... It's, it's the most effective product that I've ever bought in my life. He had eczema on his hand, and it cracked and it cracked for years. Mm -hmm. He did anything from doctor, every cream, everything. And three months on the veggies and fruit, mm -hmm. it was gone. They're just awesome. They keep asking me, what am I doing? I told them what I did with my cholesterol. I had the blood test, right? 
and it went down 100 points. 262, now it's 162. Everything is just perfect. Call now to find out how to get your free month's supply of Balance of Nature. Call 800-2468-751. That's 800-2468-751. Call now, 800-2468-751. Or go online to balanceofnature.com. Use promo code TSL. Would odors, mold, and mildew describe your basement or crawl space? It doesn't have to be that way. Transform them into a fresh, healthy, usable one with the technologically advanced Wave Moisture Control Units. The computerized operation maximizes moisture control and also expels harmful radon, combustion gases, and numerous other pollutants. Dehumidifiers are old technology that do nothing for air quality and waste energy. Wave units are intelligent, self-monitoring, do not need maintenance, and will save you hundreds in electricity. Wave units are still running a Effectively over 15 years. They've been tested and installed in public and military housing and by property managers nationwide. Buy a unit now, and if your home is not fresher and drier, you can return it for a full refund for up to 12 months. What have you got to lose? Call now 1 888 618 WAVE, 1 888 618 WAVE, or visit mydryhome.com. That's mydryhome.com. Wave Home Solutions for a healthy, comfortable home. What's up, Fader Knots? Studio Dumb loves Fade to Black and the F2B audience so much that they have put together the ultimate stereo Bluetooth system. They've done it just for you. Man, check this out. The Studio Dome SBB2 stereo system is here. It's featuring two Studio Boombox 2 SBB2 wireless Bluetooth speakers packed in its own custom hard shell case. This Studio Dome system features the very latest in stereo Bluetooth technology. The two full-range boomboxes are in true wireless stereo. You've got to hear this. It's amazing. It's just $129, and use the promo code JCRTWS, and you'll also get free shipping. It's simple. Just go to JimmyChurchRadio.com, click on the Studio Dome banner, go back Lee Tepe. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. KGRARadio.com This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com Welcome back, Fade to Black. What a great conversation tonight with John DeSouza, the X-Man, FBI special agent for over 20 years, now an author, and John, an ET investigator. Uh, John, where can everybody uh, get your books? Uh, at uh, my website, John Tama Books, and also on uh, Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, wherever fine books are sold. And if anybody's got anything that they want to report or talk to you, are you accessible? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the, my uh, uh, my Gmail, uh, John, again, John Tama Books uh, at gmail.com. That is my, don't send me any uh, secret or sensitive information. I, I won't look at it. I will delete it. That's good. <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting disclaimer, if I've ever heard one. And why do you, oh. when, when it comes to, uh, I want to get back to our conversation, but when it comes to, the NSA, uh, you know, building files and all of this metadata uh, that is out there. Are you really that concerned about it? Don't don't send it to me. I don't I, I don't want to see it. Oh, yes, absolutely. I I have no need to look at secret information or anything that's uh, anything that compromises secrecy uh, whatsoever. I don't I don't need to look at that. There's so people don't understand the kind of age we're living in, how much information is out there in open source. 
that's what I always talk about. It's out there. You just got to learn how to create your own web bots, your own crawlers. Uh, you cannot depend on the mainstream news. Don't even look at mainstream news. Just create your own advocacy for what's going on out there. You know, you're you're better off uh, putting uh, and you're better off putting Antarctica uh, as a as a search term into Google Alerts and just put it out there and just cross off mainstream sources uh, and just put it out there as a collector for any any information uh, from public sources on Antarctica, you're better off than sitting there and watching nightly news. So you got to just, that's why I say to people, there's no need, no need for secret information or, or confidential information or to deal with it. There just isn't. Now the the word of the the year or for two years has been disclosure, and I I've got my own views on it, but I just don't think uh, the disclosure is going to happen in the classic sense that everybody right. wants, and we don't even need to go there. We we don't need to discuss right. that. But um, your take, and it's an interesting one, is that they don't really know anyway right that it is it is run in the background and the people that need to yeah. know and that are making contact and are making contact they know what's going on the 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 Washington DC the bureaucracy that we deal with face to face daily doesn't have a clue right and that's pretty much your take isn't it yes i believe that people give way too much credit to the national governments they really do uh they just they want to sit out there in washington and uh and agitate for something that i don't believe they have i mean i discuss um in my book i talk about something called the carpet stain monitor uh, doctrine which is basically uh that government agencies uh would rather that people believe they're corrupt they're lazy they're part of a conspiracy uh, against uh, against them rather than let them know the the deadly truth that they're not in charge of their carpet stain that is that is the one thing they don't want people to know nasa does not want people to know that they are not in charge of the atmosphere around the earth that there is somebody else. And if you want to know what I mean, just Google uh, NASA cuts the live feed and you will see that NASA is just is not in charge of that area outside uh, around the earth. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't be cutting the feed all the time on these live feeds from the satellites whenever a UFO that they don't know about shows up. It's just something that it's just something they'll always do. And so they these government agencies i don't believe they don't they really don't know and they are following orders that's why nasa cuts the live feed every time and that's it's not just them many many agencies uh deal with this on a regular basis also they're just they're just running scared that people are going to find out they just don't know they don't have control and they don't they're not really in charge of ultimately of their of their carpet stain and that's something that they just they don't care what else you think about them, but they just don't want you to know that. Well, but we still have Wright Patterson. We still have Area 51. We yeah. have uh, the direct evidence that we have, such as Roswell or Rendlesham yes. or Malmstrom yes. Air Force yes. Base. Uh, yeah. So there is direct knowledge and direct contact there, oh, too, yeah. as well. So somebody's Somebody's got it, yes. But it's not. It's but I don't believe it's national governments. I believe that I fully believe that there is global government, which has has plenty of direct knowledge about these things, and that is in control of a lot of these a lot of these secret sites, a lot of these uh, secret space programs, and a lot of these things that do have absolute knowledge of this sort of thing. But they are, and of course, global government isn't government at all. It's just a system of control. It's the epic, like I say, the elite powers in control, and they have all the knowledge, but they're not even supposed to let you know that they exist. So try getting disclosure from that, you see? Yeah, exactly. Well, I want to close with this. I want to close with Roswell. Um, your, your, again, I keep saying the word take because you have a totally different uh, view of, of a lot of things, and one of them specifically is Roswell. 
Um, you have described it as, and I want you to help me with this. I'm going to paraphrase, but you have described it as uh, a double, a, a, a double event, right? Yeah. Right, right. A double trick. Uh, yeah, a double <laughs> trick. A double event. Um, so. I want you to try and explain to the audience what you mean by that. Sure. You're not you're not saying that Roswell didn't happen. You're saying it oh, absolutely no. did happen. Oh yeah, it sure did. Uh, however, it's um, it's there's a lot of interesting uh, things that I have found out over the years concerning Roswell uh, after it was uncovered by brave, courageous, uh, great investigators uh, who eventually blew blew the cover off of it uh, during the 80s, and they did great work. However, I believe that Roswell was, a the based on everything I have seen, especially in the national security state and concerning a lot of the things, the elements that I've talked to you about, about global government and so forth, I believe that Roswell was a double trick. And I explain in my book what that, how that works and what it is and how that's used, uh, even by our national security structure in a lot of instances, which means it was actually set up by the alien, by alien visitors in order to, for one, well, with several goals in mind, but one of the goals was to make us believe that alien visitors are completely physical, just like any of us. They're just like bodies that cram themselves into these metal shells and sail across the galaxy and just, you know, can crash just like anybody else can crash and just end up in a, in a terrible crash and dead on the ground, just like humans can. And why would it's, they do that? Well, for one thing, because they have an interest in the doctrine of alien imminency, that they are physical, that they can appear at any time, uh, that they can be here permanently at any time and uh, just show up with us. Interestingly, Roswell happened very uh, – was well, it did happen – very shortly after that memorandum of importance came out, the one saying that aliens are absolutely not physical and that they are not, uh, they do not just cram themselves into metal shells and sail across the galaxy. Shortly after that, Roswell happened. And then everyone was convinced, absolutely convinced, that there were a couple of alien bodies found in at the Roswell crash site, and that uh, they're just they're just like humans. They're just physical, just like us. And also, I believe that part of the another part of the agenda for Roswell was to was to, of course, they were going to have the the cover up happen, but the cover up itself they knew was going to be uncovered eventually. Eventually, it would be uncovered. And so that was part of their plan, too, because another part part of the plan was technology transfer. There was, uh, right after Roswell, you know, we had that enormous explosion of technology that happened all over the earth. And it was shared. Uh, amazingly, it was shared among, among all the nations. And I believe that was another part of the agenda for Roswell. But the one thing that Roswell wasn't, was what I what it was made to appear to be a couple of alien bodies in a metal shell that just happened to crash. I believe it was all it was all a psyop type operation, but it was set up with the help and aid of alien visitors themselves. That's that's what I believe. Why the theatrics of alien bodies? And I, I, I just heard what you just said. I understand that. But why the theatrics of that? What would that achieve in the end? Because if they, if if the bodies were indeed alien, you know, not of Earth, I should say, and then we recover those bodies and we are looking at them uh, uh, post-mortem, uh, you know, autopsies yeah. and so forth, and some allegedly even lived, um, why that theatrics? I mean, is it, uh, were they martyrs? You know, why, why do that? I, I, oh, I, I believe that those, the bodies that were, if, if there were bodies at Roswell, a couple of alien bodies, like we hear so often, I believe they were just hybrids created by alien visitors who have a long history, according to ancient, uh, a lot of the ancient monoliths that we see around the earth who have a long history of creating hybrids, creating creatures, manipulating DNA. And I believe that they were just created just for that purpose. And the theater was 
for this for the primary purpose of making us believe alien visitors are completely physical like us ah, very interesting i almost don't know where to go with that um <laughs> well only because it has been investigated. I have interviewed all everybody that is involved with Roswell, and and I've been trying to get to the bottom of it too in my own mind. And having this suggested is is interesting. I I don't know quite what to make of it. But again, we need to push everything to the center of the table and consider everything. Um, you know, if we all agreed, it would be boring. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, I, I do want to thank you, John, for coming on the show tonight. It was uh, just a, a fascinating conversation. Um, before I let you go, are you speaking anywhere? Aren't you up at uh, UFOCon? Yes, UFOCon in San Francisco, the UFO event of the year, March 24th, 25th, 26th. Uh, we will be having some great speakers, of course, the great George Nuri, right. uh, Tom Danheiser. We will have Stephen Bassett, David Adair, Rosemary Allen Guiley, myself, and many, many others. It will be really something. We will be breaking some new stuff there. Have you uh, ever hung out with David Adair? Not yet, but I'm looking forward to it. Man, man, man. Just go and uh, sit down and let him uh, tell you a couple of stories. Also, Mark McCandlish is going to be up there, too, as well. Yes. Re really good friend of ours. And uh, you're going to have a great time. It'll be a great conference. So go knock him dead. And I look forward to having you on the show again uh, very soon. Thank you so much, John. Great conversation. Thanks so much, Jimmy. It's awesome. Awesome being here. And I'll talk to you soon. Thank you, John. Thanks. John D'Souza. His website is johntamabooks.com. Very simple. Go to it. You can uh, just go to jimmychurchradio.com and click. Take you straight over there. His books are available. John D'Souza. What a great conversation. I'm going to take a quick break. I need to. Little boy's room. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. I'll be right back. Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of Fade to Black... You create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the Fade to Black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of Fade to Black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights. Just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go back, Lee Teppy. Hi, folks. Let's wind the clocks back 60 years. Food was different. Food provided health and nutrition, and using supplements was minimal. Unfortunately, now we have chemicals, GMOs, herbicides, and pesticides that can be quite lethal in the name of our food supply and, of course, the ever-loving dollar. Supplementing our diets can be very important to stay healthy. Cleansing from daily intruders to the body might be critical. Live strong and take charge. Log on to GetTheTea.com. Our herbal tea is a great way to cleanse from intruders. Our supplements is a great way to maintain and improve your health. When your health is not up to par, go to GetTheTea.com. No GMOs, no fillers, and organic. And very helpful in keeping you at the top of your game. 
Life is too short to feel, uh, you know what I mean. Stay in the game, at the top of your game, with GetTheT.com. That's GetTheT.com. Again, GetTheT.com. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show. On the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA. The planet. Hi, this is Chase Kletsky with Fate Magazine Radio, and you're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station, where the Fader Knots rock. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This Mass is Kyle and you're listening, listening to Jimmy Church Radio. <laughs> Welcome back, Fade to Black. John D'Souza. Man, what a great conversation. I wanted to say this really quick. The point of this show is always front and center knowledge. And John is a fan of this show. And so much so, I was uh, talking uh, to him earlier today, and he said, man, I've got the, uh, one day I want to come on, I want to read your closing credits. I just wanted to, I'm just like, you get it, don't you? John gets it. It's about knowledge and and his take and his view on, on so many different subjects. It's not only fresh, but, and, and again, if we can go outside of the box that we're already outside of, we need that. And that's exactly what John brings to the table. So his books, you can just go to uh, his website again over at jimmychurchradio.com. Click, go and get the books. All right, John is a breath of fresh air. Thank you so much. And and we cannot dismiss that he was on the other side of the fence, 20 years in the FBI, right? <laughs> the other part is, can we trust that, right? I, I love it. I love the angle, and I, I love his mindset. Thank you so much, John. Great conversation tonight. And uh, with that, I've got a bunch of uh, news that you know absolutely nothing about. Well, hopefully, except for our good friends in Australia. With the energy blackouts and the price hikes that uh, are plaguing South Australia right now, Tesla chief executive Elon Musk is betting that his company can quickly solve the problem. Or he's going to hand over $25 million worth of the company's battery packs for free. Last Thursday night, in a short back and forth on Twitter with Australian software billionaire Mike Cannon-Brooks, Musk confirmed the company's offer was sincere, writing, and I'm quoting here, Tesla will get the system installed and working 100 100 days from contract signature, or it's free. Is that serious enough for you? (laughs) Cannon Brooks responded with, you're on, mate. Give me seven days to try and sort out the politics and funding. Intense heat waves, made more likely by human-driven climate change, have scorched Australia this year, with temperatures regularly topping 100 degrees. That has stressed their power infrastructure, causing energy demands to spike, supplies to dwindle, and major blackouts uh, have occurred, and one was last month. So there you go. Elon Musk to the rescue. Very cool. Now, one of the biggest news stories of this century has occurred this week. A team of archaeologists have discovered a giant, and when I say giant, I mean giant, 3,000-year-old statue thought to be of Ramses II. In what the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities is describing as one of its most important archaeological discoveries ever. Archaeologists from Egypt and Germany began removing the quartzite statue, estimated, and if you haven't seen the video, I have, estimated to stand about 30 feet tall. And it was discovered right there in Greater Cairo. 
in front of state representatives and media news crews. Last Thursday, they brought in a bulldozer. They were freaked out on that. Um, It's in mud. The dig uh, also uncovered a 31-inch section of a life-size limestone statue of Ramses II's grandson, Seti II. Now, you have to see what this looks like. The full reconstruction of the face is possible because they have fragments of the eyes, the crown, the lips. All of that have been retrieved. Um, It's going to end up being displayed at the Grand Egyptian Museum in Giza, which is due to open next year in 2018. From what I saw with the statue in the mud, I haven't seen it all out of the mud, but I've seen most of the mud. It looks like he's seated. That's what it looks like to me. Now, I haven't seen, uh, they're they're still pulling it out. It's, It's huge. But how cool is that? And the head, man, the head is like six feet tall, five feet tall. You can see his ear. It's perfect. It's absolutely amazing. Who would have thought? In the slums of Cairo, right? It's pretty amazing. Um, Let's see here. Where am I? A federal district court judge in Washington this Monday released Jonathan Tran, the man accused of uh, being the White House jumper. And they released him on his own recognizance. They include, you know, a couple of conditions. And one of them is that he be fitted with a GPS device. Now, listen to me. He, he's he got to remain within 100 miles of his home here in San Jose, California, staying away from the White House, remaining in the country, uh, traveling only to Washington for court appearances and attorneys meetings. Tran who breached the White House perimeter last Friday night, was further ordered to comply with a mental health evaluation, you think, and told he cannot have guns or any other weapons. No kidding. He will be under the supervision of pretrial services in San Jose, where he must report at 10 a.m. PT uh, in two days. Uh, So I guess he's still en route. And then he's going to be fitted with this uh, tracking device. He uh, appeared in an orange jumpsuit, was charged with entering restricted grounds while carrying a dangerous weapon. He did not enter a plea on Monday. Both the government and defense attorneys agreed to the terms of trans release and GPS tracking. It doesn't make any sense. Now, check this out. This is where it gets crazy. When the judge asked questions about the GPS monitoring, he asked the counsel to approach the bench. And when the judge started to talk to the defense attorneys, he turned on white noise in the courtroom to ensure that no one would hear the discussion. And then he just released this guy. Just released him. So apparently, apparently, and I'm not crazy, apparently you or I or anybody can go and jump the White House fence and not have anything happen to They're going to release you from jail. What is the message that is being sent there? I just don't get it. All right, I'm going to leave you with this. I got 30 seconds. Computers that run 100,000 times faster than current ones can change life as we know it. Listen to me. They could help discover distant planets more quickly or diagnose illnesses much, much earlier than usual. We're talking about massive calculations. A team of researchers, including engineers from the University of Michigan, believe they found a way to achieve that goal using laser pulses. The researchers have demoed a method to control femtosecond, which is one quadrillionth of a second. These pulses of light that can move electrons quickly enough and efficiently. And the University of Michigan says it's a step towards light wave electronics and eventually quantum computing. And with that, I will say this has been another episode of Fade to Black. Fade to Black's executive producer is Rita Kamarian. Show is produced by Hilton J. Paul, Mark D. Kovar. Thank you, LJ3, Renee, Jonas, Dennis. Thank you, Bob. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vitoa, Mark D. Kovar, Fady by Dale. Webmaster is Drew, the geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Spaceboy, spaceboymusic.com. 
Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network and syndication is KGRA, The Planet. Thank you, John DeSouza. Great conversation tonight. Tomorrow night, right here, Linda Moulton Howe. This broadcast is only copyrighted 2017 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Follow me on Twitter at J Church Radio. Until tomorrow night, LMH right here. Everybody be safe. Go Beckley Tepe.